I'm I certain mean, instances you don't have the right yeah. to say. We just so, discipline But the trouble is, I get so many devices, right. you know, I can't manage them all. Right. Right. So you have the right to the mayor. Mayor. Or I you can go to your union. I get that. I was going to say, I didn't get anything. Today, you don't have to. And how the heck do I get back into my emails? No, I don't. There it is. Labor attorney will be here today. They'll talk about it. Okay, okay. But it's. The, you, but the, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, the gravity yeah, yeah. Of taking ultimately it is a recommendation to this council, mm -hmm. but you'll see the all the factual findings and stuff is done below. So you're not. So we don't even. You don't. We don't get to know. We don't get to know. My chair's up so high, I can yeah. barely touch. If you want, it's your <laughs> job I is I to accept. I don't know who's sitting there. Well, there's a thing on the side. Bo Champ, Chief, are we ready? Well, I feel like a little girl, like. No, I don't. Good morning and welcome to the Braden City Council meeting, 8.30 a.m. Wednesday, March 24th. 2021. Please note City Council Chambers is open to the public. All are welcome to attend this meeting. Social distancing and screening will be enforced. Any member of the public wishing to comment may do so at this meeting. At this time we'd like to call the invocation by Lawrence Livingston of Interim, Bap Bishop, Interim Bishop for South Florida Diocese of the First Born Church. Please stand. Good morning, Mayor, Council, morning. ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, our Father, our Redeemer, our Sustainer. We thank you for calling us here to be in your presence in the Bradenton City Council today. We love you being holy, being a God. You have redeemed us through your precious sacrifice and trust and unbridled optimism. Therefore, I offer this prayer, that this council meets the great challenging faces the county today, to rise as the council serving above political selfishness and becoming architects, forging city unity. Father, we believe that to acknowledge that you have blessed our community so richly through your ongoing work through this council. Therefore, we give you thanks that you alone give us the gift of wisdom and patience. And may you give us loving hearts that shall always be quick to help and sympathize and slow to hurt and criticize. Finally, we ask all these petitions in the master's name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop, and please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Mrs. Beauchamp. Good morning. Good morning. We, we do have a proclamation this morning, which I will read on your behalf. By virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Bradenton, I do hereby issue this proclamation honoring Child Abuse Prevention Month, April 2021. Whereas Florida's future prosperity depends on nurturing the healthy development of over 4 million children currently living, growing, and learning within our many diverse communities. And whereas child abuse is a crime against humanity that affects over 673,000 children in the United States each year, with over 3,737 child abuse reports made to the Florida Abuse Hotline in 2020 from Manatee County alone. And whereas the abuse and neglect of children can cause severe, costly, and lifelong problems affecting all of society, including emotional, physical, and mental health problems. In addition, the child may have social, criminal, and academic difficulties. And whereas research shows parents and caregivers that have social networks that can seek support in times of need are more resilient, 
less isolated, and better able to provide safe environments and nurturing experiences for their children. And whereas individuals, businesses, schools, community, and faith-based organizations must make children a top priority and take action to support the physical, social, emotional, academic, and mental development and well-being of all children. And whereas during the month of April, Prevent Child Abuse in Manatee County, in collaboration with the Florida Department of Children and Families, Manatee County Sheriff's Office, Bradenton Police Department, Manatee Children's Services, Healthy Start, Safe Children's Coalition, Pinwheels for Prevention, and all agencies dedicated to the well-being of children and families will be engaging in a coordinated effort to prevent child abuse and neglect by promoting awareness of healthy child development, positive parenting practices, and promoting healthy family relationships within our communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim April 2021 as Child Abuse Prevention Month and urge all citizens to engage in activities whose purpose is to strengthen families and communities. Signed, Jean Brown, Mayor. Thank you. Do we have anybody here to accept it today? Please come forward. Hi, I'm Cheryl Miller. I'm the clinical director with Manatee Children's Services. I'm going to thank you all for doing this and the support for our, our children and our community. I have some pinwheels also for you all to plant um, for pinwheel prevention. Good. So, yeah. all right, you give them to Tamara there. I just want to encourage everyone, if you see something, to say something and report. The, uh, the hotline number is 1-800-96-ABUSE. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we appreciate all you do. Thank you. Mrs. Beauchamp. Next, we have a presentation on the Florida Sunshine Law. We have Angel Coloniso and Michael Gallen from the Manatee County Clerk's Office to do this presentation. All right, thank you. And um, I asked them to come after last week being the Florida Sunshine Law Week, and uh, we figured we'd kind of get a little bit of information. Obviously, anytime we can learn anything and help us move forward in a positive way is very important. So, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, council members and mayor. May I take my sure. mask off yeah. to speak? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm so glad that you asked us to come and speak to you about Sunshine Week. It's something that um, my predecessor, Chip Shore, as you know, embraced sunshine and transparency, so much so that if you come into our office, it's all windowed. <clears throat> I myself sit behind a, a, a window. I don't sit in an office, and I actually like that. I didn't know how I, I would at first, but I can see everyone. The public knows that if they need something, I'm there. Our records are the people's records, and, and you all know this. Um, we have court records and public records, so they're different. There's a distinguishing factor, and Michael will get into that. But we embrace Sunshine Week by wearing uh, yellow to kick off the week and come up with an awareness to the public that these are your records, and any time you need them, just ask us, barring anything that's confidential by law that we can't disclose, and we have certain items, as you know, that have to be redacted. So we take measures to redact those. But by embracing every year the kickoff, we wear yellow, we promote it, we have promotional materials actually from our clerks association to make awareness and we put it on our Facebook page as well, talking about Sunshine Week and different public records laws. And also we have our training. Um, and that was the biggest, um, the biggest idea that I think we had. We came together. Our employees every year get a refresher training on the laws and as they change. And we gather them together, and it's the, the employees who deal with the public records end of the law in our office. And they go through this training. And we've had about, what, about 100, 100 Michael? A little over 100 um, come to the training and I, I'll let Michael tell you about he's my general counsel and he will tell you about that training and what takes place but the employees really like it it, it reinforces what you do and and I forgot to mention that the the whole house sunshine week got started it's actually I call it like a secret shopper week um, where the media and various outlets will test in, in the old days before computers they would test and see if everybody knew exactly what they were doing according to sunshine law did the, did they you know greet me the proper way when I asked for a public record and different things like that and what they got the information they were able to access with ease and testing our our 
ability and our as government I say are collectively um, to provide that information so it's kind of, it was kind of like that but then it morphed into computers now so there's not so much foot traffic that comes in but and we used to get a report from Mr. Shore if, if we if we did pass or fail or where it was he used to get a report they'd print that report out and they would let us know and he would improve any area that needed to be improved it told him where things needed to be improved upon so we strive um, to, to promote that and, and I promote that every time I speak these are your records that we're in custody of and I'd like to think they're in good hands because now we do our, our every year training so I'll let Michael without any further ado take thank you welcome yeah. good morning good morning councilmen and, and women uh, some of the newest council council members uh, and welcome and and uh, some of their returning and the new mayor so welcome everybody I, I mean thank you for having us and uh, thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity um, a pleasure to be here my name is Michael Gallon I'm the general counsel uh, with the clerk of courts and uh, yes yeah, so as Angel mentioned I um, you know we, we, we deal with public records daily uh, but during sunshine week there's a heightened sense of of um, you know making sure that that we are uh, following the uh, the public records laws and making sure that we're reminding our employees uh, of some of the things that should be they should be paying attention to now we do have a good record uh, no pun intended uh, of supplying and responding well to these records requests throughout the year uh, but it, it never hurts to, to give a refresher just to remind them of the importance and following this especially during sunshine week when there is an uptick and, and you have those 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 outfits out there that are trying to catch you off guard and those organizations that are, that are you know, testing public agencies, uh, including uh, cities throughout the state of Florida. Uh, so what we, what we cover this year and, and whenever we have these refreshers are really two components of, of uh, the Sunshine Law, and that is the, uh, the open, uh, open Meetings Laws, which is Government in the Sunshine, Chapter 286 of Florida Statute, and also the Public Records Act, which is Chapter 119, uh, for the statute, uh, which you all are probably more familiar with. And then we also cover um, the rules of judicial administration, which are some court rules regarding public records, and then a little bit of uh, the Department of Revenue, uh, which covers our, um, our child support section of, of the clerk's office. Uh, so but within the clerk's office, the government in the sunshine, Chapter 286, doesn't really impact us as much. That's, that's more for like you all, open record, I mean, the open meetings. Uh, but but the Public Records Act is, and that's what we focus on mainly. And if you, you look at the, we'll cover the quick definition of a, I'm not going to give you the 35-minute presentation. This will be the, the 90-second one. But a public record, just to read from statute, is uh, it's all materials made or received by an agency in connection with official business, uh, which is used to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge. Now, that's very broad. It it's, you know, covers these documents in front of me today. Uh, but it also covers any, um, any uh, audio recordings, any uh, video recordings, uh, maps, papers, pictures, photographs. It covers your social media, it covers your emails, and it even covers the notes that you're taking up there right now. Even if they're not completed notes, uh, if they're precursors to a, to a memo you're going to write later, those can be public records. So somebody in here could you know, ask for those at any moment, and then you, you, may, you may have to turn those over. Uh, the, if you don't follow the laws, obviously there's penalties, there's civil penalties, there's fines, there's attorney's fees, uh, there's, you know, public officials can be removed from office. Uh, so there, there, there are all these uh, penalties associated with it set in statute, but it, it's a good thing that it's easy to comply with. I mean, so long as you're following uh, set how, what the Florida statute promulgates, uh, then, then, then you're in, you're fine, and you can you know there, there's there's no consequence. Although there's lots of folks that, that attempt to catch you off guard. What we'd like to remind our employees of is we use this acronym called RACE, uh, R A double C E, and each acronym is a reminder of what they should be doing, or each letter is a reminder of what they should be doing when they uh, receive a public records request. So what that covers is first to respond quickly when someone has a request. Make sure you immediately respond. Let them know you received their request and that you're working on it. That way it keeps them from being agitated. Uh, a, acknowledge it. Acknowledge that it's a public records request. Make sure that, that they know and you know that they're officially making this, this request or acknowledging it. You want to clarify what the request is. They, they, might, they might be requesting a, a broad, you know, sweeping hundreds of dollars worth of records that they don't really need. So we, we remind our employees to help narrow down the scope, narrow down the time frame, narrow down what they need and then communicate with them throughout 
so they're not frustrated while you're getting these records. You know, sometimes it's quickly just going to the Xerox machine and printing something off and handing it over. But other times it's more lengthy, and we have to work with our IT team to gather these records. Uh, may, they may be Board of County Commissioner records that, that date back years. So you want to communicate with them during this and then explain. This is the, t the difficult part sometimes. Don't, ex don't explain what the record is. We don't want to get into that. We don't want to uh, pretend to know or, or to give advice on what these records are. But we have to explain what we cannot provide. So a lot of times, and this is, this is the big rub in public records law, is the Constitution provides the public has access to records. They're, they're open to the public. They have access to these. But on the flip side, the Constitution also provides a right to privacy for records. So we have to, sometimes there's, there's an area, there's a gray area that we wrestle with and we have to pull out the statutes and figure out what, what we can provide and what we can't provide and then we have to explain that to the requester. And, and that can be challenging at times and, and there's a, a conflict there sometimes. So that's, that's kind of the main uh, point there when, when we have those, those issues. So all of this is an effort to remind our employees that are doing this daily uh, to be on their toes, you know, to be thorough, to be comprehensive, and, and really, and to get it right. And, and fortunately, knock on wood, you know, uh, I think our community does a pretty good job of this, and, and the, the Angel has a good record of it, Mr. Shore, uh, uh, setting, setting forth the, um, uh, th that history as well. So, so that's kind of the, the quick summary of, of what we do every year annually. Uh, Angel mentioned it's, it's, it's one, um, you know, the meeting that we have once a year, but with, with you know, over 200 employees, and social distancing this year, you know, we had about six sessions versus one large session because with, with all that involved. Uh, but but we're, I, like, I like to think that our employees enjoy it and, and that they gain a little bit of something from it. So, and you guys also, your organization uh, receives these requests as well. So it's, it's good to keep on top of things. So thank you for having me here this morning. It was a pleasure. And um, I'll let Angel close it out. Thank you so much um, for allowing us to come and bring awareness to this. I really appreciate that. And maybe sometime in the future for Sunshine Week, maybe if you wanted us to come speak again and give a little bit more um, in-depth look at it, we could do that as well. Thank you. Any questions? No, I thought it was a good thing just to kind of keep reminding and, and showing that our staff does a great job. Of course, obviously, it's it's times when you got to think and make sure you do the right things. and and. And one thing I always live by is do the right thing for the right reason. And the most important part of that is when nobody's looking. Right. So, you know, if you're doing those, we'll be in, in good shape. So right. we appreciate you coming and thanks Thank for being you. here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. And um, we'll move on to citizen comments. And citizen comments will be accepted at this time on any non-agenda items. Comments will be accepted on the, on the public hearing and agenda items at the appropriate time. Um, I only have one card, uh, Glenn Jebelina. Come forward, state your name and address for the record. Thank you. For the record, Glenn Jebelina, good morning. Thank you very much. Angela did a great presentation, and I will tell you right up front that uh, not only this city, but the county and the school board have exemplary records, and I do a lot of records requests. And, and they've never failed me in a, in, a, in a timely manner, especially your guy here, he's, he's like the next day. Um, and she's right, we do have a right to inspect the records. I've been at the school board looking at building plans up on the third floor, and if I have a right to see them, they produce them. So we have good, good sunshine laws. I will tell you this, they do get abused sometimes, so I'm not, I'm not happy about some of the stuff that they, that shenanigans that go on. So I guess one of my questions is, going back to the agenda, the city of Bradenton, I mean, I'm sorry, the city of Palmetto, the school board, the county, every item that there, it's on the agenda is attached to the agenda, except the city. Now I've heard things about, oh, we're not ADA compliant. Well, I don't know how a little city like Palmetto can be ADA compliant, and you guys can't. So I would suggest to this board that. Well, Glenn, let me just, that what you're showing is the CRA. Well, it's the same thing. It, you have it on today's docket too, so I, I printed out the wrong one. But not only the CAR, but your agenda today, uh, I requested some dockets, uh, some information. And I have to email all the time to get that. It's just an inconvenience. It should be open to the public. We just talked about sunshine laws. I don't think what, what, what is so difficult. If there is an ADA problem, 
then perhaps uh, you know they can then email for that information. But for leave 99% of the public out and jump through that extra hoop, write an email, wait for the return, it's just it's just an inconvenience for the taxpayers and citizens. And it's bad governance. I think there's a better way to do it. I think it's a, uh, a push of a keystroke, personally. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, <clears throat> Sadowski funds. I sent you all a, uh, I sent the mayor anyways. Um, I heard through a very reliable source that they are getting slashed 66% this year. So that is very disheartening after uh, our, our county just went up there and talked to both the president of the Senate and the House uh, addressing our concerns. And as soon as they left Tallahassee, they 86'd it. Uh, the call-in option. I don't know what the big deal is, but I think it's very beneficial for the citizens. A little town like Palmetto has it. You call in, you, you put in an ID number, and you punch nine to raise your hand and six to unmute. I don't know why this, this city is not involved in that yet. Uh, the other thing, Wi-Fi. I don't know what the big deal about Wi-Fi is. I come in here and there's no Wi-Fi. You know, who do you think pays that bill? The citizens pay that bill. So I don't know what the big deal is about allowing citizens to get Wi-Fi. Again, another, another stroke. So I hope you take these things under consideration. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other citizen comments? Didn't fill out a card, that's okay. Come forward at this time. Not seeing anyone, we'll move forward. Ms. Bochamp. Next on the agenda, we are asking for the approval of the consent agenda, items A through H. Pleasure of the board. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve by Mr. Sanders. Is there a second? Second, second by Councilwoman Barnaby. Any further discussion? Start to vote in Ward 1. Yes. Ward 2. Yes. 3. Yes. Four? Yes. Five? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, Mrs. Bochamp? Next, under business advertising petitions, hearings, and communications, we have City Administrator Callahan with the Surplus Property Inventory List presentation. And today, this is a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Callahan. Today, I'll be assisted by Tamara, who will be controlling this from... <laughs> Over, over there. Uh, a couple of things just want to start off with. Uh, certainly this is a long time coming. Uh, where this started was uh, probably eight months ago when we started looking at all the properties after, after uh, Glenn had requested the surplus property list and we realized that we were not in compliance with that list. And what we did is I had uh, Jesus, when he was here, go through every city property that we had through our through our inventory list of, of through fixed assets and properties and come up with a list by the legal description and by the intended use or if it was actually being used for something or if it was perceived to be vacant and could could be available for affordable housing what he then did is put together the list that you had that said potential for affordable housing surplus properties um, the reason we're doing this is florida law does indicate that you are supposed to every three years go through and decide which of the properties, and I want to I want to make sure we're very clear, may be available for affordable housing. There is nothing that says you have to make it available for affordable housing or you have to sell it for affordable housing. It says you may do that. The city of Bradenton over the years has done a very good job of making properties available for affordable housing. So a little bit of what I want to do before we get into this list. I'd like to talk just for a minute because I think we're very proud of our record of what we've done towards affordable housing over the years. And also know that the presentation today does not include the CRAs. This is for the city of Bradenton and not the CRAs. Okay. Uh, over the years, we have donated surplus property to Bradenton Village. Almost eight acres of Roush Field was for the development of Bradenton Village. We donated property at 17th Avenue and 1st Street East for the affordable senior housing complex that you see as part of Braden Village. Uh, we coordinated land and swapped multiple properties to facilitate the building of Rogers, a neighborhood school, Nate Rogers School. Number of properties were donated by the city and coordinated that process. Not directly affordable housing, but was in the mission for what the neighborhood wanted. Uh, city-owned properties, there are six, 
seven city-owned properties that have been donated for affordable housing for multiple houses, not just seven houses, for multiple houses. We purchased two HUD homes and rehab with city funds that were sold as affordable. Uh, Habitat for Humanity uh, has had over $750,000 of value for affordable housing. City adopted future land use changes to Mini Rogers to make the site at that point in time available for affordable housing should an affordable housing developer want to work with that. Uh, the city increased the density of affordable housing in the city's urban village with the goal to attract more affordable housing on 14th Street. The city contributed funding to the Addison Project for affordable housing. And the city contributed economic development incentives to Grand Palms for senior affordable housing. That is not to mention the two projects that we just heard coming forward that during, at the end of the year, you guys gave uh, funds for affordable housing at the, at the corner of 6th Avenue and 8th Street. Understanding is that HTG is moving forward with that for affordable housing. You contributed a $425,000 or $460,000, I think, low interest loan for that. And we also heard that most recently um, down by the FOP property at, I think, 26th Avenue and 9th Street, that senior housing project, affordable housing project is going. And those are truly affordable housing low-income affordable housing projects. So we look forward to continuing to work with them on that. And like I said, I think that does not include the CRA properties that we've done. Obviously, what we've done with Singletary, uh, um, with, with the Love Apartments, there's lots of things that we've done within the CRA to promote and help develop affordable housing, 60 units on, on Lincoln Village. So I think we've done a lot. There's more we can obviously do. And I think one of these things is to go through this surplus property list and see if there is anything that truly does fit to be able to make available in the right circumstances for affordable housing. So I just wanted to go through that because I think it's, oh, and that does not include the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, over 14 properties back in the NSP program that we either completely built with the NSP funds or rehabbed and sold as affordable housing as well during the NSP program back in the, in the recession. So I think we've done a lot. Our track record is pretty good. Like I said, I think we can do, we can do more. So. Are we say what NSP stands for? Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Mm -hmm. they, they, and they weren't necessarily affordable housing, but it was neighborhood stabilization. Well, they, they were, they were not low income housing per se. They were affordable at that point because they were in the hundred and some thousand dollar range. They were not expense, overly expensive homes. I mean, I was gonna bring it up. That, that was a great program because it really did a lot for the neighborhoods where we, where yeah, we and built they them. fit into the neighborhood because that was the goal was to create infill homes that fit into the neighborhoods where there were opportunities. So. Thank you. So, and the law that we're working with today, like I said, indicates that we need to do this and we intend on doing it. What the, the process I'd like to do today is go through the surplus properties that we have shown. I think a few of them will probably come off the list. Have you guys finalize that list and then bring forward the resolution at the next meeting that you would approve that would establish them as definitely affordable housing properties. It could, and then when you sell properties that are on that list, then there's an intended use. There's an intended use that the proceeds from those sales will go out to assist further in affordable housing efforts. So that's why it's important to get on the list. And it's also important to not put things on there that you don't intend on doing that with. So, okay. So Tamara, if we could move forward. There's the statute. Uh, 420-0004, I put in here just because it defines affordable housing by state statute. We can move forward. 166-0451 defines the process that we're going through today, requiring that every three years, which we haven't done, we've admitted that we haven't done, this will get us on track to, to be compliant and then be able to move forward at least every three years, okay? Um, here's a list of the potential affordable housing properties that we'll go through today. And what I'll just do is just, because what we have in, in the list that was attended is they're given a number and they're given a legal description and they're given a parcel ID so that they can be identified by list. Yes, Mr. Sanders. First one on your list is a lift station. Um, what we have is, in some instances, large pieces of property that are not suited for affordable housing, but they look like they are. And that's kind of what we get into. I 
I didn't know if somebody yeah. wanted to make an offer. Or well, they may want it. It's probably pretty expensive for a piece of property, but that's what we're dealing with is something appears to be vacant. In some instances, there's, there's a lift station. In some instances, there may be dry retention for a road that just looks like it's sitting there. There's things like that that come up that don't make it available for housing. As in the first instance, the first one you look at here, if we can move on camera number 12, Number 12 is over on the east side of town. It looks like it should be a property that is easily available, right? I mean, just looking at it from an aerial, um, it's 65 by 145 foot deep. It looks like it should be, but it's not because of the use that's there. Should we actually have it on there? Then? No, we should not. That's what, what I wanted to do is make sure we look at ones that, if somebody looks at it, it just appears that, but then let's say why it is not available and why we don't intend on making that on, on the final list. A lift station being on the property, obviously. Another use that we've come up with since then, remember this was done and intentionally done by Jesus who didn't really know all the properties. I wanted him to look at them and just say, hey, does this look like it could be? And that was the intent versus going through and saying, nope, 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 no. It was letting somebody just look at them. So that's what we did. Item 12 is not available and should not be available. If we go to the next, items 14, 15, and 16. These are properties on Manatee Avenue, 1700 block of Manatee Avenue. We have had these since uh, DOT did the widening. They came available to us. What you look at between the size, location on Manatee Avenue, I'd love to say something affordable housing could go there. I don't know how it can happen, certainly because of the nature of being, you won't get curb access on Manatee Avenue. But uh, if somebody wants to be ingenious, and try to figure this out, we are all for it on this because these have sat in our arsenal for quite some time and not been able to figure out what to do with them. I don't know, maybe previous councilman can buy those lots in between him and his house and we can make it commercial. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed 17th Street East, so yes. But, hmm. Mrs. Barnaby? Well, yes, Patrick. Or I think Ms. Patrick. Barnaby. Oh. I, I don't see that being used for housing at all. No, it's not. It's on because it's, it's thoroughfare. There would be no curb cut to there. It could be used as housing potentially if somebody behind it acquired it, brought a fence line up, maybe an accessory dwelling unit or something that could, that could be connected from the other side, but not from the Manatee Avenue side. So there is potential, but it's, it's not a great site. We could use it as a landing for an overpass for a walkway for kids to the school. If, if we don't want it on the list, we don't need to put it on the list. If we think that there's a future use, if we think there's a... There's no place on the other side of the road for it to come down. Oh, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I have no problem putting this on. Um, just because you put it on does not mean it's absolutely going to be sold and it's going to be gone. It just means it's available. I, so my question, because um, I'm, I'm, I'm up here wearing two hats right now, thinking affordable housing, yes, and then, uh, you know, economic development also for, um, you know, when I see that strip there, uh, I don't see it as affordable housing. I do see it as a potential commercial site. Uh, you know, it'd be a strange commercial site, but someone could certainly figure that out. So that my question is, as we're, as we're talking about surplus properties, and you've already addressed this, um, my way in on, because there are several that I'm going to be looking at later on, in the, uh, let's say the 14th Street CRA, where I see that they have greater value for, uh, you know, redevelopment of potential commercial than they do affordable housing. So your job is to review and decide if you think that it should be available for affordable housing. Like you said, I think there are multiple uses of some of these properties. Some of them are make, very, a lot of them could be commercial use. There's other parcels we have right in the middle of a commercial district, which is not a good place for a house right in the middle of a commercial right. district. So those, those are determinations you'll make. We may have surplus properties and then surplus properties for affordable housing. So the, 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 the ones that we're looking at with the red dot. Um, those were ones that were just pulled out of, they we, say we, vacant. We, we pulled them out because they're debatable as to what yes. the use should be. That, I, I agree with that. Yes. And that's what we're going through is going through this and then we'll let the public weigh in as to what they think on any of these properties. But I mean, I think the premise is you guys need to make the call. There's no force into it. Um, but we do 
if if it can be put into to service either as for affordable housing then then certainly we we need to to do that because that's the intent is to make things like i said our mission has been a lot of making things available for affordable housing the cra has multiple properties that we listed last year and the year before as surplus to be available for affordable housing some move forward some did not that's another process for them to move forward as to what the intent is for that so should we as we're looking at each property to have this discussed that i mean instead of going back um and saying what because I, I look the back one you just had uh, 25 5 uh second avenue east it's got a lift station right i have a house uh in ward three right on where's creek it's got a lift station right next to it the house has been there probably as long as the lift station's been there they're probably both at the beginning of the city's time so it is compatible uh you know just because the lift station's there doesn't mean you can't put a house there part of it is access making sure that there's access to a house beyond the use that we have those would be the keys. And then once you get back to the back side of this lot, it is narrow. Then will it meet any of your, will it conform to be something that could be a lot because it gets back to 45 feet in the back. And the front side where it's wider, where the use is, then what are your accesses? I mean, you can say that it is and say, we're going to explore whether it can then be utilized. You don't have to sell it as that. You can say, look, we put it on our list and then we can figure out whether it's something we're going to do something with or not. I mean, the ones that don't make the list are not going to be out there for affordable housing. There's others that, that can be available for affordable housing. Like I said, the statute doesn't say you will make these available. It says you may make these available for affordable housing. Okay. Mrs. Coker? Yeah, and just, just because you can build a house on it with the lift station doesn't mean that you're going to want that there. And would it be marketable and would somebody, I mean, I don't know that that's a good idea. You never know. Remember, and I'm only saying that, re, 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 I mean, careful what you ask for. Somebody wanted a property with waterfront views at 20th Street and Riverview. And we sold them and they built a beautiful house knowing they backed up to a lift station. Mm -hmm. And then complained about the lift station. <laughs> but that's, that's beside the point. I mean, you bought it knowing there was a lift station there. So the view in that particular instance, it was worthwhile because the view was great and you would put up with the list station because you weren't going to get that otherwise. So, so there are opportunities. Where Patrick is talking about down by the Wears Creek Bridge, there are houses with our list station kind of jammed right in there. So they do exist if the lot can be utilized and if we make sure that we retain all the rights that are necessary to access for our purposes that piece of property. I, this though it seems impossible for anybody to build something on there. That lift station is right out at the road, Second Avenue. I mean, you wouldn't, you couldn't. I don't even see any possibility of putting the house there. I concur, but you know, I'm throwing it to the board. I th I'd say take it off the list, and this is it's just a city property. I mean, you're 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 the ward representative there, and know more about that property. It's down at the end where we've looked at a lot of things at Second. That but but there's not room. The, the lift station's right out on the street almost, so you're always going to have to have access to it. Who'd want to build a house there? It'd be different if you had a river view, but that's not the case there. No, I understand. And, and, and the access is from it's one just, side. It's, it'd be impossible to build something like that. Okay. Mr. Callahan, when we're going through this process here and we're looking at these, um, is this something that, you know, obviously it's the pleasure of three, you know, do we do, does it have to be a vote for three to take that off or is that going to be? Well, it's not on yet. It's got to be, I think you need to vote it on the list, not off the list. So, so we're going through looking, but, but yeah, again, you may you have, have, and I, I agree with Mr. Sanders on that property, but you may have three that say, well, it's worth trying. And, I you know, you or you may have a developer that says, I can figure it out because it's in a location I want, you know, so how is this process going to go? You can do that and you have another piece of property. Say it doesn't make our surplus for affordable housing. Developer comes and says, I want to buy this property. I know how to make it work. You can still sell it to them. I mean, that's the, the you can surplus still do Surplus later that. on. Yeah, we have surplus properties and then we have these that we're making available that seem, seem very well suited for affordable housing. And that's what we're trying to look at. Well, like, so, that, so going up to the next one, um, 1701, 19 and 1723 Mantee Avenue East, small lots, commercial frontage, 
um, very limited access and use right now, but when I look at the row of houses behind it and thinking about the future and being on, uh, you know, Manti Avenue, could someone come in and buy that whole swath up and want to put a commercial um, development in there? And our three pieces are key. Yes. So at what, what point do we say we strategically decide to hold these because they have little to no value right now? And that we see that as a future development site, which may be, which may include for affordable housing, maybe commercial with affordable above. The whole block. Uh, the whole block. Uh, well, well, at least uh, R three and the other one, two, three, four, five, right. six, seven, eight, eight. The right. additional eight. That's not out of question that someone would do that in the future. No, it's not. I mean, so that doesn't need to necessarily make the. The list. You can sit there and say, "No, we're not really interested we, we at this might, we point." We might decide if someone's coming in with a good product. Right. You know, say we'll make you the best deal. Of it. Right. And that's the key to making it happen. So. Yeah. Right. Mrs. Coker. Well, uh, so, so we're not required to make it available for affordable housing. It could just be sell the lots off. Depends on future use. Yes, you can because something is not necessarily suited for affordable housing does not mean it's not got another use that can be that can be utilized. You have a surplus piece of property. We have 640 acres at Hardy County Road, out at Hardy County. That doesn't mean it's, it's, it's not really suited for affordable housing at this point, but it is, it is property that we are not currently using. We bought it for a purpose. We bought it for the purpose of potentially in the future being able to put our, our sludge out there. So that was a use we bought it for. Just because it's not being utilized right now doesn't mean that it has to go on a list like this. You'll find some things in here that do make, I think, probably could make the list. Okay. So I think if we go to number 43, the vacant lot at 8th Avenue East, this is probably an ideal location potentially for that. The reason I say it is currently we lease it to the church, but that's for parking. But that's not necessarily a long-term best use of that site is a city-owned piece of property to be, if the church wanted it, they should buy it from the city so that they can control it. I mean, those are some things that you run into here. Just the fact that we said we didn't have a use, we put it, let somebody else use it in a way that it makes, it works for them. But potentially, this is a site in the, in the it's a large site in, in the neighborhood that could be several homes here. So, I mean, those are the things you look at. Um, it currently wouldn't be sold, but whether we renew a lease with them is something that could be determined in the future. And they would have the option to buy, should they? If you made that option available to them, yes, I think. But those are the things that you would look at. But potentially, this is a site. It, it fits kind of the criteria, I think, that would work. So, um, like I said, the statute says you may sell it. It doesn't say you have to sell it for affordable housing. So, uh, it's when you do sell it for affordable housing, then you need to use the proceeds in a certain way. So on a problem-solving issue like this one, which may be affordable, uh, but it's also serving the purpose of a church. But churches don't pay property taxes, so if we sold it to the church, it would come off the tax rolls, which is no benefit to the tax to the citizens. You know, a good option might be to hold, <laughs> because you know there's there's no taxable advantage to selling it to the church. There is not, and and what happens is there becomes an expectation that it's their property when we let it be used a certain way. I mean, that's unfortunate. It becomes an expectation. Oh, you can't do that to me. This is my property now. I've used it for this forever. And in essence, that's, you know. Not, not if they're leasing, not if they're paying us well, rent. And if they aren't, they should be, at least a dollar. <laughs> that's more like it. Yes, that's why, yeah, that keeps that's why those are kind of placeholders because they are not leases that are a huge advantage to the city. They're the advantage of somebody else. And then the city has to determine at some point in time what they think is in, is in the best interest of the citizens of Bradenton. It could be the citizens, it's not necessarily the citizens next to the church, it would be the citizens overall is in the best interest. So um i think certainly you would need to notify somebody who is leasing property from us that your intent is to move forward in a different path if that's the case maybe give them the opportunity if you're so inclined to do that but uh, on, on a sale but i think these are the types of properties that create the dilemma as to whether you do or you don't move forward 
Well, I think also with something in the not that specific property, but if if the need is there for them to use it, then the need might be there for them to buy it because if they're needing it, then there's a reason. So I think that's something we look forward and and we don't do it talk about a specific piece of property, but we talk about the citywide. Well, there's two parcels here back to back. One we show as as potential surplus. The other is dry retention, I believe, right next to it. To the west. To the west. Actually, it's drainage canal. Canal. Yeah, so it looks like it's a vacant piece of property, but it's actually drainage. To be honest with you, we we've had our eyes on this particular parcel as a potential stormwater pond. So there you go. So, so again, looks like it on its face. Further discussion probably says it's not, it's, again, it's not a viable candidate at this point. But if we took it as a stormwater pond, they still wouldn't be able to park there. Or would they? Depending on the size, depending on how you size right. the pond. Right. Yeah, that's a, but that could take it away from I mean, between those two parcels, whether you utilize all of it or part of it, and, it, and once you determine the size of the pond, it may leave only a parcel that maybe suits for a house and not for. A, a lot of a parking lot. So those are those are all tough questions. And, and I and I see Miss um, Coachman going. I'm going to get I'm going to get in big trouble on this one. Yeah, I, I understanding that should we sell it to the church, uh, then it comes off our you know uh, we don't get the taxes for it. Uh, they are citizens of the city, and they don't all necessarily live right there in that area. There's some that live among the city, so that would be still a benefit for citizens of the city. So I, you know, I, if you, you, if it's been allowed to be used that way, and I understand what you're saying, that, you know, they kind of tend to feel like, well, it's our property, well, then I think they should definitely have first dibs to buy, and it should not be a concern of ours that we won't be getting taxes off of it. We're gonna at least sell the property and make something. Well, it's also if it's a dry retention pond, it's not getting taxes either. So, exactly. you know, both ways, but both also. Ways. But it benefits the citizens, yes. that church, to but, have some. But other property. churches around the city had to build a parking lot and purchase the property and have the parking lot to, to service the church. So, like you're saying, maybe it's the best option on that one to sell it to the church. I, I think there's the, all, all these considerations you want to take into account. The statute realizes there's an underlying need for affordable housing. So that's why this, that's why they're saying we need this, that affordable housing is deemed to be important. I mean, we can go through this list on every one of them and probably come up for reasons why we would never include them. But we're sitting there saying, look, the statute is asking you to look at it and say, is there anything that you legitimately can make available for affordable housing? And if there is, you probably should. That's all. That's all. That's what they're really saying in this. So we can move on. Obviously, the next one at 820 Manatee Avenue is the site for the post office. We've already addressed that. That's not a surplus on this site. The The next one is 11, 11, 11 22nd Street West. Um, I believe that from the perspective of uh, this could indeed be available. For that, the only question that I have on this particular piece is because it does connect to Wares Creek, it has potential use for our long-term requirements to maintain uh, potentially the Wares Creek because it does go all the way from roadway all the way back to the creek. And how did we acquire this, Carl? I am not sure how we've got this one. It was gotten before you got here? Yeah, I think it's been around quite a while. So from this particular standpoint, it, one, it is one that provide it is wide enough and, and deep enough to build because that is consistent with the houses in that area. Um, but it also is one that in Mid Creek provides us access. But depending on what we do with the property two, two doors down that we own now right on, on 12th Avenue, there, that may be limited to depending on what we do with that site as well. See, and this is what I'm bringing up is like long-term strategic planning. What is what is the best for, because sometimes, you know, look, we have reserves in the bank that some people would say you shouldn't have reserves, you should spend all of it. 
until a hurricane comes, you know, and then we have reserves and we were smart. So um, something like this, you know, yes, we could sell that. It would probably be a, I, I, don't, I don't think it would be an affordable home. I think it would be a very expensive home <laughs> um, because of the creek access. But is it more advantageous for us to keep it? Then some people would say, but you're keeping it. It's not on the tax rolls, which is what you, you, you will hear this. There will be those that say you should give it to the church, sell it to the church. That's fine. And then the people that don't go to that church will say, yes, but that's our property and should be on the tax rolls. All I'm, I'm just kind of devil's advocate on all this stuff that I'm just looking at it from every angle. I've been around long enough. I'll be criticized for anything I do. <laughs> yes, this site is probably more suited for a nice home consistent with the neighborhood. That would be surplus property, maybe not surplus for affordable housing. Now, um, that, I mean, those are, those are the options that are available. This is an infill type, type site that mm -hmm. Mr. Sanders was talking about in Sanders before. This is an infill type site. This really is. Jim, is there anything on 86 I don't know about? Is there a lift station or something there as well? Because this one does seem it's a relatively small lot. There's no lift station. Right. What is, what's what's the, the, the property on our, or what's the real, it looks like there's a building that's halfway on our property. Well, you can't tell. These, these maps are not necessarily, okay. these are. Typical in that neighborhood. Okay. When you when you look at the green lines on the property appraiser site, they're not necessarily official. What is, what is the size of this? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. See that. Okay. So it goes right under the property. It's a rear access sewer that that serves all those properties north and south of it. So the the, the green dotted lines indicate that. Is that? Easements. Okay. So so it's not it goes down to twenty second Avenue, it doesn't go out to twenty second street. It does come out to twenty second street. So there's a line that runs right under that property. Correct. That's not on this map. Well the sewer line wouldn't show, but you can see it in the photo. There's a sewer vehicle right in that front of that photo. Yeah. Hmm. So we can investigate this one. We I think really can't put it on the list the and then see what we family. need. See, pardon? We can't sell a, 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 a property for a house that's got a line underneath it. Depending on where the line is. Remember, you can, you can sell it with an easement to that line. What if, what if it's right down the middle of the if property? If it's right down the middle, well, that would be, that would be Braden River Lakes or River Isles. Maybe, maybe a mobile home would go in there. And then we could just, move, we could just move the home every chance we need. Let's, let's do this with this one. We'll investigate it. We'll make sure that it's suitable. Like I said, the, the statute says you may. If we get one on the list, it doesn't say you have to. We'll take a look at it. If it's not suitable, then we'll remove it. What I'm going to do is we're going to take these. Before we get to the next meeting, we will investigate thoroughly everyone to make sure that there's nothing that should keep it from being on the list. If this one we put on the list for today, we are going to bring back a resolution in two weeks that says these are the properties. We will look at something like that to make sure that it is indeed suitable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll want to write it right underneath it. So, so we'll look at those things, but I certainly think that because of the size and nature, 86 is a pretty small lot. If it could be, it seems to fit the, the bill. So we What's can take a look width? at that. 86 by? Um, no, it appears to be minimal as far as 86 is the number of the lot. Oh, okay. okay. Do you know the size of it? Um, by description, it, it's not big. It's only almost a tenth of an acre, so it is not a big site. It may not even fit our qualifications, so that's why we'll take a look at it. It is a uh, very is it, small parcel. Is parcent. it actually even buildable? It, it may not be, okay? Yeah. Like I said, I'd like to put it on there as a potential. I don't want everything we look at to say, no, we can't do anything, then, we're, then, then it looks like we're not, we're not trying to do anything. Let's take a look at this one, put it on there. We'll investigate, see if it, if it meets any of planning's code so that you could put something on there, and if it meets anything that Jim is requiring us to make sure that we have to have this. So. Let me ask a question, Carl. On, on properties like that, to the, the homeowner that lives above it or behind it, if there's a way to parcel it off, that then they would be able to possibly do something with it. Is that 
a way to get rid of it and also add it back to the tax rolls. Um, potentially, you could determine, you could go to that property owner and say, look, we need only a half of this. Are you interested in the western half? Right. You could do that to, so, that they, so that they include it into a viable piece of property for the long term. Right. So you could potentially look at that. I mean, kind of like, remember what we did over at Lewis Park. We had the corner of Lewis Park and that homeowner, we all kind of had the driveway and what we were going to do there, we sold them the next 10 or 12 feet to make that more viable along their, their garage because it wasn't space that was really going to ruin the park. But we said, yeah, we can do that. So, so there's options to look at to make probably most likely the house to the north and the south. Looks like someone might already have a shed on our property. <laughs> That's that what I'm saying. Yeah. If the line's right. My guess is the property line is along the edge of the shed, but we still. could probably make a good deal without. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so do we? We'll put that on, but to look at it will. We'll determine whether it makes the final resolution in two weeks. Well, we could we could because we could also keep the easement section. So you're right. basically you're splitting the baby, but you're also keeping the. We'll have to keep the easement yeah. if we need it for the, yeah. for the sewer. So. Sometimes you have an easement that you don't need the whole property, but you need the easement. So we'll have to, and you want to be able to work in it. We don't want Jim's guys going, I got the easements we normally get are foot on each side of the line, you know, and there's no way you work in there. So that's, you know, that's certainly not anything we want. Yeah, and you can tell from the photos, too, that the, the FDL kind of follows Okay, so we'll take a look at that one. Um, 102 7th Avenue West. Uh, this is 17th. 17th Avenue West, excuse me. This is the second half of the piece we donated, it's a former DMV site that we donated for the senior housing to uh, Braden Village. You currently have that under an agreement with AMFM Ministries to try to do their project there um, for help for the elderly, but they have not been able to move forward with that yet. So that's uh, been quite a few it's years. It's been two years now. So with that still sitting out there, all we said is you needed to show economic viability and be able to move forward. Well, they've done neither yet. All they did is give us a pro forma, but we've kind of let it sit there with them under when, a lease. But when, How long does that agreement last? I'd have to look at it. I just brought, um, I just brought the AMFM file to make sure that this was the site. Because that looks like an affordable housing site to me. Yes, it does. And, and we will need to determine that with... AM, FM as to what their intentions are. And what the terms of that lease are, are we indefinitely gonna hold it or are we able to say, look, you haven't shown viability, you haven't shown any move forward, let's, we can't keep it reserved for you. Okay, 101 is the park, former parking lot across from the um, lawn bowling hasn't been used as a parking lot in quite some time, may be more viable for a commercial development rather than affordable housing, but it could be a complex. I mean, it's a big enough site to be a, a complex of some sort, because if you recall, I think Ms. Barnaby was maybe the only one on the board at that point in time when we were looking at the shuffleboard court as a housing project right. with the DDA. And, so. and the uh, the county was looking at setting up a shuffleboard complex closer to I-75 because it would make it more attractive for the statewide and regional shuffleboarding. We had worked out all those arrangements with the county and yeah. Lakewood Ranch and all of those things to be able to help contribute towards that when the DDA wanted to buy this from the city when they wanted to buy the shuffleboard court area from the city and make, that was under Thoreau, make a housing complex there. This had been parking associated with that or public parking as 14th when it was a little bigger. Remember there were meters in this site. Uh, we ended up fencing it off because it became a hangout around the 7-Eleven for people just hanging out there. So we ended up fencing it off. But it is certainly surplus because I don't picture a need at, at this point. Uh, I remember Mr. McClellan at one point saying we might need it for stormwater through Wares Creek things at one point. So it was a site that could that was being considered if we were doing those types of things. Right. Whatever 
I'm sorry, whatever happened, did, did this whole idea just go kaput after a while? Did it lose steam and the county lost interest or? Well, I don't, there was no need once it felt, once the cell fell through and there were, there was no potential developer of the shuffleboard site. It just kind of fell through from that standpoint. And so everyone knows it's technically not a shuffleboard site. It was the mm -hmm. lease, the lease was with the long bowling club. Yes. And the lawn bowling club died off. And so the property has been sitting in limbo agreement uh, because the studies that we've had on 14th Street does show, but someday the shuffleboard site being development for, ha for housing, commercial and housing. But so there is not, when we say shuffleboard, they technically do not have a lease. It is the lawn bowlers that had the lease with the city. And they, they don't exist anymore. What? The well, the shuffleboard, they do the not, shuffleboard they do not. group now has a lease. But year it's, to year. It, it's a short-term lease. And um, the other thing is, um, really technically, this was probably parking for Jones Auditorium. Right. When right. Jones Auditorium existed, which was the big use there was the, the auditorium. Right. Which was our practice burn, with the la one of our last practice burns. Yes. It charge. was quite a, quite a nice... <laughs> <laughs> Demolition. So okay. I think, so, it's a, I think it's a placeholder. So no to this. Right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Eleven o five Eighteenth Street West. Um, by all means. Anybody who can help us get all that equipment off that site, be our guests. We have had Mr. Rudiso working on this. Had me working on this. This is an excellent site. For affordable housing. Yes. Mm -hmm. You might want to individually tell everyone the history of that, so that because we do have a problem next door that's the, the, never. The, yes, the, the next door neighbor is a conscientious objector to anything about where you park vehicles and the amount of stuff you keep in front of your house. It, his house next door has been a code enforcement issue for years. Parking of vehicles all over everything in that house, not keeping up with it, and then spilling over onto this lot. We gave him notice to try to get out. The only thing we haven't done is towed all the vehicles away. And when we tow all the vehicles away, my feeling is we will have to fence this entire lot to be able to keep it that way. I was going to ask, why hasn't it been fenced yet? Because you have to tow every, I mean, we could fence it in, but we could, then we have to provide a gate. So it is big vehicles. I mean, there is travel trailers. There are everything sitting on this lot. So. They're all non-compliant. Yeah. Can they be scrapped? Um, no, what you're going to do is you're going to pay to tow them away at some point, and we will probably have to have the help of our Miss Bevan with us when we do that. So, but we said we've given time; it's it's run out. We are ready to do that to get it off of there, and then make it available for for the right folks to buy and do something with. Okay. Three hundred two Fourth Avenue. This is the, um, we call it the Wilcox parking lot. It is not really available at this point. It's just an empty piece of property that is being utilized as a parking lot right now. Which we've talked about possibly being a future parking garage. We looked at it as a potential garage site, parking over retail. We have initial drawings of, some preliminary drawings of that if we get to where we need an additional parking garage at some point in time in the future. This is 1421 is the site we acquired. Uh, last year for use of the sign shop and other things we're currently finalizing and finishing that up um, for use for public works and or in the future anything else that wants to go on 14th Street that becomes viable. Um, there's also an adjacent site next to that that we would love to acquire in the very near future um, just to the north of that um, for similar type uses that is contiguous to the site <laughs> but in any instance it is not uh, not surplus for affordable housing at this point. Um, 2101, for those who have been around a while, is known as the former Star gas station site. Um, get your green glasses here. Um, contaminated site in the past. Remediated, so my guess is not, suit, probably has restrictions, not suitable for housing, so. Uh, 305 17th Avenue West is uh, the site next to the solid the wastewater treatment plant 
that we own and it is being reserved for future expansion of the wastewater treatment plant. That was part of the understanding when we got this. That's why Roush Field and the things over there were probably we could get rid of for the for the housing authority, but we knew we needed to retain some of these things. So, and that's why the DMB site was made available once we got that because this site was still going to be our expansion plans. And that's also right in front of the juvenile detention center. Yes. Yes. It, exactly. it backs up to the juvenile to the razor wire at the juvenile detention center. Not exactly where you want to. This whole site becomes an interesting site in the future if indeed the county ever gets off the radio shop for the sheriff for their repairs. Then it becomes a more viable site for maybe a lot of things, the whole block in there. But mm -hmm. certainly we're still retaining it now for the future expansion plans. <clears throat> we'll need to discuss does it need at some point in time, does it need to be the whole thing or part of it that we would ultimately need? But those are, it, that's always been the, in, the intended use of this particular site. Um, when, when we, in the past, when we let some people use it, our agreement was them, they put the decorative fence in front because we wanted it to look at least reasonably attractive. And so that's what we did with it. But it's, it's our site. We currently let, again, you know, as long as it's not being used, the Pirates during a full season would use it for parking, overflow parking for the ball games, for spring training games. But that's, that's again, not a use worth saving it for if there was a future use that we needed. And who gets that money, the parking fees? Who gets that? The pirates? The pirates do, or in one lot, it goes towards an arrangement with the Boys and Girls Club for the site that's next to the school. Uh, behind, behind Rogers, the first lot behind Rogers is a lot that um, the Boys and Girls Club had been swapped for in all of our movement to get the, uh, the new facility done when they took the Boys and Girls Clubs out. So they retained that with the potential that it could be used for future use of the Boys and Girls Club and they reach a an arrangement that retained cash flow to the Boys and Girls Club for the Pirates to be able to use that. But this is this is the Pirates are allowed allowed to use that. Our agreement with the Pirates is they they, they create and get to keep all revenues, but they also have all the operating expenses associated with that. I would like to see the Boys and Girls Club do something sooner than later because well I think their intent that. was with the DeSoto Boys Club I mean that's what all of that was done with DeSoto and getting everybody all the uses over the DeSoto when they redid that this is a small parcel relative yeah, it's very to that. tiny I can so, but it was potential and and, and I'm not going to call on Mr. Brown to get into that because that's a whole other issue from Boys and the Girls Club. The only thing I'll say is the Boys and Girls Club is very active in Rogers schools and the other schools around. From not had, just so you understand, and there's some public misconception still, we were serving 90 kids at a building that probably should have been condemned. Mm -hmm. We're serving hundreds of kids through the Boys and Girls Club now in that community at the school level. The school level. So, and, and it's, it's very successful. I know the chief just had something out there at Rogers, I believe, not too long ago. with And so, you know, we're serving the kids in that capacity through the Boys and Girls Club, which is three to four times as many as it was in a building that was ready wow. to go. Since then, yeah. there's probably been three to four times as many students or, or children that need a right. recreational center. I mean, 13th Ave moved to East, and Boys and Girls Club, even though it was a small number, that number of, of those children are all out right. and about in the neighborhood. Those kids that were at the club, about 70 of them were being bussed in. So it wasn't even the neighborhood kids. So. Well, all I can say yeah. from yeah. personal experience day to day, right. there are a number of young people that need something in that area other than And terrorizing. I think that's something that I will bring up in the near future of some development in that area that could help that. Appreciate so, that. Yep. Yeah. So that goes through those lists. So I guess to recap, we're looking at potentially, we'll look at 83 before we bring back the resolution. We'll look at 86 before we bring back the resolution. And um, 98, we'll look, into, we'll look at our arrangement with AMFM. And 102, we'll try to get the people off the all the vehicles off the lot. You know, we're going to, so everyone, I, I mean, that's going to be a real, that I think that we've been as patient with this person as possible, that I, I, I think we might have to step up our legal, uh, you know, um, 
enforcement with this guy. I mean, he's been telling us he's going to clean it up. He's, he's cleaned up. A couple of times we've been down heavy on him, and he cleans stuff up for about a month and then moves it, starts bringing it back in. But this has been going on the entire time I've been in office, since 2006. Yeah. He was a problem I inherited from Michelle Weaver. That was a parcel we had to clean up because it came in split basically in half that we end up getting the entire tile to, but it took time to get both sides of it together, so a little bit. So. But that's been a long time since we got it accumulated. But together. it's not only just a surplus property, it's the guy next door is a yes. chronic code enforcement violator that is, I think, exceeds, he's probably could go down in state history as one of the, one of the most chronic code enforcement violators that's ever existed. <laughs> Well, it's like my grandmother always said, everybody can serve as something, even if it's just a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so questions for Carl, then we have a public, public hearing. hearing. Thank, All right. you. Okay. thank you. All right, thank you, Carl. Great job. All right, we just will open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak? Seeing none. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see you, Glad. All right. I'll give her one second. All right. Please state your name and address. Okay, uh, Glenn Jablina for the record, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, the guy on, on the last one you just talked about, just tow it over to his property and put a fence up and be done with it. I could straighten it out in 24 hours, I'm telling you. 18 years he's been abusing that property. So I wanted to bring up um, some of the properties. So... The small lot size uh, on 20, 2208, that's 3,200 feet. That would make a nice tiny house community if we're concerned about uh, the sewer line. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, I talked about the last one. Uh, the one on by the, uh, the jail there, 1421, uh, you can make um, affordable. You could, you could do a pop-up homeless shelter there. Uh, if you're going to uh, do it for the wastewater, or that could be a tiny farm facility. I mean, they're all they're all mobile. There's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, the the site on 14th Street that is a brownfield, make it a solar farm. Uh, the other one on the uh, 30517 uh, water treatment. Oh, that's the one for the pop up. That's right down the street from Turning Points. You could do a pop up clinic, uh, pop up a homeless shelter there. They would have the services. There's a lot of opportunity there. <clears throat> I just want to bring up um, real quick that, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that I had to, to go to this extreme to get where we are. Uh, the AG did write me back and said it's not a jurisdiction. It's, uh, it's a local one. I'd have to feel some, fill something out with the sheriff and go to 12th to go to Broski. <clears throat> I'm not going to do that. I think Carl's on the right, on the right path. I'm not going to pursue it. Uh, but 13 years is certainly... Um, unacceptable on anybody's radar. The other thing I want to bring up <clears throat> is that I think it's important that if you do it, we don't make the same mistakes we did last time, like on 920. So I think you need to put in a time restriction. You need to put in either 30 years or the life of the land. There is, uh, what else I got in here? and open it up for profit builders. I think that's important because I'll tell you right now with the county, <clears throat> we have one nonprofit and she can't handle it all. So what I did, I don't want you to plagiarize this, but I did print out for you <clears throat> the nonprofit agreement. It's very good from the county. I think if you just, if you just do a shout out to them and use their same language, um, it, it goes in depth of, of what a nonprofit is. You have to show statements before they convey that property. Uh, currently, Community 260 and Trinity Without Borders are the only two nonprofits. We're doing a modular, uh, an affinity home back, actually, on the Palmetto property with uh, border, uh, Trinity. So I think this is a great opportunity. I did talk to Carl on the 11th Street for a first uh, home responders. I think your, uh, your T4R, um, Land use is great. I hope the county uh, accepts that. You guys are moving in the right direction. I think you need to continue that. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else? 
Anyone else? All right, we'll close the public hearing. Okay, so the next step will be to bring back a resolution which defines the properties of any of these. I think there's at least a couple that probably do indeed qualify um, that we'll make available, put on our list. And then at that point, like I said, you may do things with them. You may not. There is nothing that says you, what it says is you have to do it with these. We find other properties that are available. You can certainly do that. I mean, we've helped accumulate properties. You've seen that history. I think our history of doing things is better than our history of having meetings. That's, that's what it gets down to. We are, that's, and that's unfortunate that we let it get to that point. But what we have done is good. What we haven't done is done this piece. So I think that the next step for you all when you sit as the other board will be to go back through the CRA properties again and see if there's any properties again that, that can and should be available, as well as looking at our homes that we are utilizing for other things and see if it's time to maybe dispose of those because they are in the affordable range for things. So I think that makes sense as well within the CRA. And hopefully um, from, from our perspective within <coughs> six months we'll have the 60 new units at um, Lincoln and with any real luck we'll have 200 more units through HTG. That's without doing any of this. So. Um, and, and those are meet the definition of not um, the moderate housing or anything. Those are truly low, low income uh, developments. So, so thank you for your time and we'll bring back that resolution at the next meeting. All right, thank you, Carl. Thank you for all the information and hard work. You and your staff did a great job. All right, moving forward, Mrs. Beauchamp. Yes, next under new business. We have resolution 2128, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Bradenton, Florida, sustaining disciplinary termination imposed by the city. Uh, this is a request for council to accept the findings of the merit board. Um, and this is most of council's first foray into working with the merit board. Um, so we've invited our labor attorney, Greg Herring from uh, Gray Robinson now. Uh, to explain the process a little bit and then exactly what happened in this particular situation. So thanks for coming, Greg. You're welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name again is Greg Hearing. I'm with Gray Robinson. I'm from Tampa, Florida. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of representing the city in labor relations for many, many years. Uh, just to refresh you all because it may have been a few years. It's been a few years since I did a merit board hearing for you all. Uh, so it's probably been a few years that you've had uh, a resolution come to you for uh, either approval uh, or not of this termination. Uh, the Merit Board, uh, as you all may recall, it's made up of five members that are appointed by the mayor with your permission, the council's permission and consent, uh, and they serve uh, to hear employee grievance appeals. And uh, they, uh, all, all of their authority derives from the employee handbook section eight uh, it sets forth the due process that the city provides its employees. And uh, what happened in this instance is that the Merit Board met on February 18th uh, of, of this year uh, in, in chambers here. It, it's a public hearing that, and people have the right to attend. And of course, the employee has a right to attend. And under the rules, the city must present its case first. And we did. We called five witnesses, uh, presented our case, rested our case, and then they heard uh, the employee's case, Mr. Herminio uh, Gonzalez, who was uh, a, a recycling crew chief in public works. And the reason that we had the hearing was because he exercised his right pursuant to these rules uh, after he was terminated pursuant to Section 7.8 of the Employee Code of Conduct for Insubordination. And that arose out of an incident that occurred on November uh, 19th of last year where he had not one, but two, but three, and all the way up to four supervisors give him a regular directive to go back out on his route. And he refused to do so because he wouldn't get overtime. And management made the decision that because that is a group three offense of insubordination, which the first offense is termination, and because it was a very poor example and it caused the city to incur overtime, they recommended his termination. That went through a pre-disciplinary hearing process uh, that is before the merit, before you get to the merit board, uh, and the assistant uh, department uh, director, Mr. Beauchamp, was involved in that, and uh, 
uh, he sustained the termination. And then the employee exercised his right to uh, have the grievance heard before the Merit Board. And as I said, it, that hearing was held on February 18th. That was a four-hour hearing. This, this employee had a lot of due process. Uh, and they uh, deliberated and determined uh, that uh, they recommended to this council that you sustain uh, the termination of Mr. Gonzalez. So we're here before you to ask you to do that. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. I am saddened that I did not come to that hearing because I wanted to hear more in terms of what happened. Uh, I understand that this is just something that doesn't occur a lot and counsel is to you know just say you have our blessings this is all good but I really was concerned about the actual incident and after hearing you at least I have a little bit more information but I do want to ask the the employee was it, is it proper for me I can ask these questions it, 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 you have you're going to be the ultimate uh, arbiter of whether uh, the the uh, termination stands or not so certainly I appreciate you giving yes. me this opportunity yeah. then um, um, the mr. Gonzalez he refused to go out to do his route because he would not get overtime if they I mean what's he that's what he said and I can give you a little background if I may please sure he had been out on his route and he came he didn't finish his route and uh, he came back to the yard, and his uh, before he uh, uh, went back out, uh, or supposed to go back out, he was directed by uh, four supervisors to go back out and finish his route. And he said, I'm not going to do it because he had been sick one day that week. And so he was not going to get overtime to stay and finish that route, that recycling route, which included some pretty significant businesses and some pretty significant areas in the city. And he said, I won't do it because I won't get overtime. The reason he wouldn't get overtime is because the city uh, pays overtime uh, for sweat hours worked. And when you're sick, that doesn't count towards sweat hours. So he was going to end up, in his mind, working more than 40 hours. He didn't work more than 40 hours uh, and, and not get paid overtime because eight of those hours were sick leave and he didn't you know, go to work that day. So he just refused and he, again he was a crew chief and he did this in, in the crew room in front of multiple employees and and turned down uh, three supervisors in that crew room and even called Mr. Craig Keyes on the phone who was on vacation who directed him to follow his supervisor's direction and he refused. So the city really it was left with a very difficult situation of having to terminate an employee that it didn't want to have to terminate but under those circumstances it certainly had the mm -hmm. just cause to do so and needed to do so because of the poor example he set. And this was a crew chief. And he, so he's been with been He'd been with, with the, the city, city for 11 time. years. He oh. wasn't a new employee and he was a crew chief and he had been elevated to that based on, on his prior performance but he was in that position to set an example for the other employees and he set a very poor one that day. Now he was ill. Was he possibly part of the there was a, a large number of employees that had COVID? That wasn't why he it was wasn't him. out. And we don't know, and, and frankly, if I knew, I'd probably ask for you all not to have me say that in public. <laughs> well, I shouldn't. You're absolutely right. But I do recall that there was quite a strain on um, the, you know, the city's services because so many employees were out. So I, I just wondered if that was part of it, but you're right. We cannot talk about that. Um, I just needed to know because this is my first time being a part of approving someone's termination, you know, ending their livelihood to take care of their family. And I just wanted more information because what I had didn't give me anything other than it was insubordination. I didn't know. I certainly understand. And we purposely, the, the, the board chair asked that the city not put too many details in that order, uh, I think as a, f a favor to Mr. Gonzalez for future uh, employment opportunities. But you do understand it's important to know that as I, I uh, give my vote. But I'll make sure next time, even though this doesn't happen often, if I'm still on council, I'll make sure I make the hearing. Well, so I welcome I the inquiry. So I'm glad somebody's interested in my job, frankly. <laughs> Mr. Roth. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so the policy to why the over, because I was just curious of the overtime um, stipulation. So, and I understand it's sweat hours, sick days. Um, 
and I do know that we allowed uh, that, that the uh, not that we allowed that the um, uh, public works unionized s several years ago um, while I was on board, and that we do negotiate with them annual well th with their contracts and this this um, sweat hour policy um, was that something that uh, was part of new union negotiations that ever come up or. It's absolutely covered by the collective bargaining agreement, and so you know, ASME did not file a grievance over this uh, issue. Okay. Uh, this employee brought this uh, merit board process on his own. He wasn't represented by ASME through there, and there was no contention by the union that the city violated the contract. Well, and and, and it's more important for me to know that that this is because every every several years when they renew their their contract with the city, that's when we have the, they have the opportunity to say. Hey, we don't like this policy, you know, um, and we want more money. And we say, well, we do like the policy, uh, so we're giving you a, a raise or something. But we're going to keep the policy in place. It's something that isn't just mandated. That's it's correct. usually well, something that's bargained for. That's right. They have the right to ask for more than the law allows. The right. city complies with the Fair Labor Standards Act, and this policy complies with that. It's in compliance with law. Has been uh, ever since for the 30 years I've been representing the city, but the the union does, to your point, uh, does have the right to ask for the city to have that count toward over time. And the city has the right to bargain uh, against that if they wish, as you said, maybe give a raise somewhere else instead of doing that. And this is a term and condition of appointment that has been bargained with the union over the years. Okay, because I, I, I don't feel good about, uh, you know, terminating someone that's been with us for 11 years. And that, but, but then again, there are expectations of, of employment, so, and we do have a bargaining unit. Yes, sir. That's correct. And just the only comment I want to make, Miss um, Coachman, is I served as the chairman of the Merit Board for a number of years in the 90s, and we had probably six or eight cases over that time, which was very difficult. I agree with your comments about being difficult, but a lot of times we found that employees fired themselves from what their actions were. So that's seems to be this case in my opinion so all right well the chair will entertain a motion mr. mayor yes ma'am miss Barnaby uh, at this time I make a motion that we um, Sustain. accept resolution 2128 a resolution of the city council of the city of Braden Florida sustaining disciplinary termination imposed by the city all right, we have a motion. Do I hear a second? I, I, I'll second that. All right. Any further discussion? Is there anyone here to speak on the employee's behalf? Uh, I, I took a look around the room and do not, did not see him, and he was not represented by counsel. Okay. All right, any further discussion? Yeah, I, I, you know, it, 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 it grieves me to be seconding that motion. It's not something that I feel good about, but we do have a city to run. Well, and Mr. Mayor, the, the thing is, is that knowing the gentlemen that, ha that are involved in uh, supervisory capacity over at Public Works, I've known some of them for a long period of time, and, and I've not ever found them to be unreasonable they at times can be hard taskmasters, but I have not found them to be unreasonable. Um, and I think it's important that we show support to these employees as well. Yes, All right. Seeing no other questions, we'll start the vote in Ward 2. Yes. Ward 3. Yes. Ward 4. Yes. Ward 5. No. Ward 1. Yes. Carries, motion carries 4 to 1. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for being here. Yes, sir. All right, Mrs. Beauchamp. Uh, finally, under unfinished business, we have a discussion regarding the planning and community development director position. Thank you all again. Um, I think uh, we had an applicant in last Thursday, I think for a, a round of interviews with you all. And from what I can tell, it went well from my discussions with her. Um, what I think, if, if you all are so desirous, I think the 
it would be probably appropriate at this time someone to make a motion that we enter into negotiations, if that's the case, if you think you liked her and you're ready to try to hire her to have staff try to negotiate a contract and get her on board if that's the case. But I would need, that would need to be a motion from the city council to do Mr. that. Mr. Roth? Yeah, I, I move that uh, we um, uh, move forward with the applicant uh, to hire her for that well, position. And to Negotiate. enter into negotiations. Yeah, and, and, that, and that we work with her to try to get her on board as quickly as possible. And I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Brudicell, is that motion sufficient? We should probably have the applicant's name uh, for the record since it's not in the... <laughs> Robin, <laughs> Robin Singer. Robin Singer. Robin Singer, okay. So that'll be in the motion. As any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. 5? Yes. 1? Yes. 2? Yes. Approved 5 We'll reach to out to her today. Okay. Okay. Um, council reports will start in Ward 1 today. Council reports, Ward 1. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was his turn. Yeah, so we're back to number one. So. Um, let's see. Council reports. I, I don't have a report today. Okay. Mm. Ward 2. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If you will indulge me, I have something I would like to read into the record. Um, Many of you know that my husband has been the announcer and official scorekeeper at Manatee High School for the girls' basketball team. For the last eight years, I've been the uh, team mom, um, chief cook and bottle washer, and ran the concession stand. And I really want to share this today, so if you will indulge me, I have a commentary by Sally Jenkins of the Washington Post that I would like to read. I'm tired, not from today or from yesterday, but from 40 years of it. 40 years of writing the same damn story about the same NCAA shortchangers in suits who would begrudge women athletes so much as an equal amount of air and attire if they thought it would come at some man's expense. Sick and tired of the chiseling administrators with their multi-million dollar salaries and monstrous heaps of revenue who act like women basketball players should be thankful for a uniform that isn't funded by a bake sale. The women's basketball tournament ought to be an NCAA flagship event, yet it continues to be treated as some kind of cheap subsidized junior varsity by the book cooking crooks. All these women ever do is raise their arc of performance, commanding steadily increasing viewership and graduate at a sky high rate of 93%, for which they get petty insults and cheap treatment. The ludicrous inferior weight room these women were provided in their bubble site at San Antonio, a single rack of weights and a couple of yoga mats. That's nothing new and it's no surprise. Nothing changes ever. On one occasion in 2004, Tennessee and their coach Pat Summit arrived at their accommodations for a Sweet 16 to discover that they have been put in a seedy motel along with a police dog convention. It was one of those joints where the corridors were all outdoors and the food was a vending machine. Every time a player left her room for a bag of peanuts, German shepherds would leap at the doors and the windows and start baying. In the motor lobby and parking lot, trainers were walking leashes around, dogs around on short leashes. The whole place smel smelled like canine. Women are 50.8% of the population and they earn 57% of all college degrees and they make up 44% of all NC athletes. You know how many female athletic directors there are among the 64 schools in the Power Five conferences? Four. The Women's Final Four is an annual sellout, and ESPN paid $500 million for a TV contract bundling the, champion, the tournament with 24 championships. Do you know how much money a team like UConn, Stanford, or Baylor will get for winning the women's tournament? Nothing. 
The NCAA provides no payouts to women at all. It refuses to factor the women into any revenue sharing. Exactly where does the NCAA, which calls itself a nonprofit and benefits from all manners of preferred subsidies, deductions, and tax fa favors on its billions in TV and licensing revenues, gets off pretending that the women's tournament has no value at all? And where does it get off serving these athletes slop? And where do they, giving women a combination giving women the combination antigen and PCR tests for COVID-19, while women, men undergo the only the more expensive and more reliable PCR. The 2019 Women's Final Four Tournament in Tampa set records attendance in the arena of 21,000 people. Fans jammed local hotel rooms. More than 3 million TV viewers watched Baylor's 81-82 victory over Notre Dame in the championship games, and the ratings were up 24% since 2016. This year, ESPN decided to show all 63 games of the Women's March Madness, presumably because of demand, value, and advertising. But the NCAA finally Funnily enough, won't break out the specific numbers on the women's basketball tournament revenue and operating cost. Their finances on the women are opaque. Do some math for yourself. A single sold out arena at $30 for a face value ticket, that's at least $600,000 per game. All told, 274,507 fans attended the 2019 Women's Tournament, and that's not counting concessions, and that's not counting advertising. They got tens of millions of value in there, sports economist Andrew Zimbalist said. Now, certainly the men's tournament is worth more. Its 22nd year, t or 22-year TV deal is for $19.6 billion and can, can command 300 million viewers across CBS, TBS, TNT, and True TV. That still doesn't explain why a, man, uh, a, a men's team that wins a single game will get a payout of $2 million, while a woman's team that wins the entire championship tournament will not get a cent. I bring this up because there are young ladies in this community that do go on to play Division I basketball. And I think it's important that we realize this. I remember a time when Ms. Coachman and myself had to sell trash cans to get our cheerleading uniforms. So to the NCAA, I say, I see you and I'm going to watch. When you know better, you do better. Thank you for your time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Barney. Mr. Roth? Uh, thank you. Um, We've got a, several questions from previous meetings. First, um, uh, we're talking about the HTG uh, affordable housing. We had an individual come up, uh, a longtime um, mechanic uh, shop owner. Are we working with him on um, what what can possibly be worked? Because we're now we're loaning the we're doing a low low interest loan for them, but I, I've heard uh, that they're also going to be making a bigger request possibly. So, um, well, I mean. Maybe, I mean, that's what they're saying. So, um, you know, what are, what's what's going on with the person that came before well, us? Danny Anderson came forward and, and made some comments here uh, about the offers that were made for his property. There are some, you know, and I called him back and I talked to him about what, you know, told him that the city would certainly look at it making no promises as to what can be done because unfortunately his property is non-conforming. Being non-conforming in that area means it would no longer be able to do certain things. I mean, he can't expand his business. He can repair it and he can replace, but he can do work on it up to 50% of replacement value. So there's certain things he can do with the property. There's other things he can't do. He can't expand that business at all because it's a non-conforming. And that's, that's by our, our comp plan. That, I mean, that's our land use right. Because we don't have the ability just to say, oh, he could come in and try to get a land use change, but then you're talking about a, an entire land use change all over the downtown. And that's going to be because you can't spot change things. So we're looking at what we can do for him, which is not really much other than explain the rules. Um, 
I know I talked to the realtor who, who worked with the other people around there and said that the offers that were made were consistent with the offers that were accepted elsewhere. So that doesn't mean anything. Somebody else thinks their property's worth more. That's their prerogative. HTG is prepared to move forward without that property, understanding that it doesn't make as good a property. It's not as good a development as if you had that parcel in there. Um, one of the things that when I talk to the, the representatives is it's a little difficult to go, okay, well, this one's worth 200000 and all these other folks got 130 or 40. So they were trying to stay consistent with their offers. So that's where they are. As far as going back with a lower ball offer because it's non-conforming, I understand that that was not necessarily the case, that the, the, the person came forward was aware that it's non-conforming, maybe not 100% aware of what non-conforming means sometimes, but, it's, but is aware that it, because he's looked at doing things on that property in the past, and that's from talking to our planners. So. So we have reached out, reached out to both sides to say, is there any way to make this work? Is there any way in working with us to make this work? But to, I, I told him, it's not realistic to think that the city's gonna supplement the offer for one person to try to do things like that. There may be other avenues that you would have to look at as to how to make this a viable deal, knowing that they're coming in and looking to you for things if, if they can actually make it work. So I'll talk to HTG, I'll talk to the realtor involved, and I'll talk to, to Mr. Anderson. Okay. So. Well, and, and on that, I, cause I, I and, and thank you, and, and I, I would just wanna know that we've made every effort to, uh, you know, this, my, my, my goal is to always be a fair player uh, you know, um, someone should not feel that they're being taken advantage of. I don't know that that's being happening or not. There should be every uh, effort made to to do the right thing. I, I don't like a project that's got a little cut out, uh, you know, because a deal couldn't be had. Um, you know, I think realtors make deals happen. So, you know, uh, you know, I think that uh, I, I just I'd, I'd like to see every every stone unturned you know turned over to, to make sure that, that this everything's been happened to move forward for any any future considerations that i'm going to be voting on so just wanted to make that statement there um also the next one is there's something that had come before well it was going to come before the planning commission and it got changed there's a property in the middle of ward three just adjacent to ward two a church property that uh someone um uh, it's coming in as some kind of private private sale going on that they're going to be considering uh, land use changes. Uh, I got a call from a, uh, and I know that the, there's, I'm getting, I'm, I don't know if everyone else is hearing from the neighbors around it that they're concerned that, you know, there's been a, a property for a long term that's been used as a church and it's got a lot of green space and everything like that. And now Patrick, can you stop for a minute? Let's yeah. get some legal advice on this. Yeah, um, yeah I was going to say this is a, I mean, it's, I don't know that there's an application pending right now, but it is a quasi-judicial decision that is likely to come back before this board, so I wouldn't get too um, too far into the discussion about the project itself. Okay. Now, if, I, I know there were some comments about the city buying that property no. potentially and things like If you want to talk about that, I think that's fine, but I wouldn't get into any discussion about the actual project at this point. The project, it's okay. So well, I, I know that the city was never. Well, I know that we've never we were never approached. That's a misconception out there. Right, we right. Offered it for free, as well, well as offered it for purchase. And yeah, right. And that's what I was going to say. If the if the city wants to clear up that misconception, if the council wants to do that, I think that that's fine to have that discussion. Well, and. Um, Okay, I, I, I'll talk to you about, I, I have something else came to, to light on this that uh, may change the outcome of it, but I'll talk to you before I move forward on this. Okay. And I believe correctly, if we, if you receive any emails from it, please forward to the clerk's office so they can keep them, or, or to uh, Marshall. To Marshall. To Marshall and planning so he can keep it for public record for the future. So anything with that, please just forward on. Um, and again, remember, we really shouldn't be talking about it with, with them. And you just explain to them it's the legal part of it. I can, only we can explain what happened is it right. was going in front of the planning commission. Right. Yeah, and that's what I did with most of everyone I talked to or emailed back. Here's when the planning commission meeting is. Please come and, and state your concern. Right. They so that we know the the applicant has withdrawn their 
application, but they are intending to come back with with some other some other form. So good, thank you. Okay, okay that that'll be it for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sanders. That's a new report. Mrs. Coachman. <laughs> Back to normal. This is more normal sometimes. Oh, wait. <laughs> you sure? Okay. Um, Councilwoman Barnaby, thank you for reading that. Um, as you see here, there are three of us, and we're more fortunate than some women in the um, sports arena because we have equal vote and equal salary, equal say. So uh, let's hope that that continues. Um, wow, what a different seven days make. Um, um, last time we met, I mentioned that I would have a Zoom side chat, and I did, and it went well. I have some um, improving to do, <laughs> but uh, I went well, and I'm looking forward to communicating with the uh, public more and more and providing information. Um, with that said, though, I also want to remind everyone to uh, visit the City of Bradenton's website as well as my Facebook page because a lot of the different community events are um, posted on there. And I think it's important that the public keeps, you know, being informed. I wrote a little list this time. Um, I have been getting a great deal of emails as well. You know, there are some citizens out there that are really in need, and um, their homes were at one point on waiting list, promised with promise to do some repairs, and then lo and behold, something happens and it not it doesn't get done for various reasons. So, just being able to try to help those citizens is definitely. Um, I know on my mind and as well as everyone else. Wow. Um, today was my first no vote. <laughs> um, and that's okay. <laughs> and it's okay um, because we have equal votes and equal say. Uh, I just have to make one little quick comment. I guess I find it interesting that a 11 year employee would all of a sudden refuse. So I just, I just, there was so much I didn't know. It, and um, no, no uh, offense to the merit board or the attorney that was present. It was what I saw. So in seven days, I have interviewed someone for employment and I have voted yay or nay for someone's termination. What a seven days. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and Mrs. Barnaby, thank you for that. As a girls coach for many years in high school and obviously all of that, it's important to keep moving that narrative forward and, and is very important. So thank you for that. Um, first off, I'd like to bring up, you. the, the board here asked, tasked me and, and Carl, and Carl did a lot of the work helping with it, um, is about a lobbyist. So to bring that discussion up. We did talk to Ballard Partners, and they sent us back a letter that they would, uh, to assist in your discussions, we recommend an annual contract at the rate of $55,000 annually billed in 12-month increments. This contract would cover the city's needs for the remainder of this session and the 2022 legislative session, as well as any issues that might develop this summer. So, you know, I know we had talked about, I think they were one point at 60,000, but they've come down a little bit and said they would cover both sessions. So, um, you know, discussion, concerns on the, you know, I, he tasked us to do that, we did it. Now it's up to the board here, the council to decide what to do. So. I have a problem with it because it, we didn't, it didn't come for all of us. I didn't know you were directed to do that. Right, was it the last meeting? Yeah, the last, yeah, meeting, the last meeting, yes. Yeah. Just really? get the information. Yeah, it was just a, that was yeah, our Yeah, but you only negotiated with one person. Well, that's what I, I mean, I was asked to do that only, so. I didn't you know, hear that. Yeah, right. that was, I believe Mrs. Barnaby had asked and the board consented to do that. And I'm, did we I, vote on that? I didn't, I'm not saying either way. I'm just doing what I was tasked did to do at that time. vote on that? Yes, we yes, did. We did. Yes, we did. And, and you I voted, voted for that. Yes, you did. Yeah. Uh, the vote was well, four to one. Oh, four to one. one. Were, you, were you the one that did that? I was against it. Oh. Yes. 
So, but that doesn't mean I didn't do what I was asked to do. Okay, but still, uh, that, that to me, that's okay, not I transparent. I was here, so that's why I didn't remember that. Excuse me? I, I said it, I was listening because I was quarantined. So, I mean. Well, I was speaking. Yeah. Hey, come on now. Let's, we, she was just saying she was listening. She didn't realize your vote was against, but it was four to one. Again, we operate by majority. And that was what the majority well, asked us to do. I didn't say we didn't so, operate by majority. Right. I don't know why you said that. Well, because you just said, Mr. Sanders, that we didn't vote on it, and we did vote on it. So that's what we we're clarifying. Okay. So thank you. All right. So again, it's the it's the pleasure of the board, and I and maybe I agree or disagree with some of it, but I don't think that uh, you know it's what this council is going to want to do. And if we, if from the leadership role, if we go with this. It's what the council decides. If we don't go with it, then I would suggest that we RFP soon to get three companies in here if we're interested in going forward. So, yes, ma'am, Ms. Coker. Well, I, I, I was one of the, I'm the one that kind of started this, and I still think it's important. I spent time last week on the uh, Florida League of Cities uh, legislative Zooms, paying attention to what they're doing, because I know there was discussion about that. But I, want, I, the more I've gotten into it, the more I still feel like we need someone that represents our interests specifically and not somebody that represents everything in general. Plus, I think we need to be able to have access. Um, that was part of the problem with this year with COVID and getting access to your legislators. I think that some, sometimes um, we might have specific interests that might be different from other cities. And I, on my own, have done a little bit of researching as to who the potential, and when Marianne Ballard was definitely one of the ones that was very well respected, there are a few of them that just stood out. And so in the interest of time, I, I, I'm in favor of it. Is that a motion? I, I, I'll make the motion that we approve the contract, yes. As presented? As presented. I'll second it for discussion. I haven't seen a contract. Well, um, you have a contract? No, I just have Proposal. the letter from them stating what they will do. Should so. we have a contract? Scott? Yeah, I think we can, uh, if, if the motion would be to move forward with finalizing a contract with Ballard, I think that would be fine. We can bring that back on the next agenda. Satisfactory for the motion. Well, the motion is not to approve it. The motion is to bring back a contract to approve. That would be my recommendation if we don't have a contract right now. Okay. My understanding was that's what that the last motion was, was for you to go and negotiate with Ballard and to come back. But, I mean, if we need a contract, then that's... Yeah, we need to... Yeah, we need to yeah. Can I make an amendment to this motion? Well, let's let's finish it. Carl, they didn't send us an actual contract back. No. They sent with the intent. Letter. Previously, they just given us a proposal, right. which we had distributed last time around, but it wasn't a contract. Correct, right. It was showing types of services that they offer and, and all of that. <clears throat> the letter that came back. Uh, then they sent us the time frame, which I think we distributed. Uh, could have been, which was for the 12 months and the times that were going to be necessary to do things, but not a specific contract. So is that? to amend her motion to your motion to say that bring back an actual physical contract to approve? So amended. Yeah. Second, Second agrees. All right. Discussion, Mr. Roth? Yeah, um, I think I said this at the last meeting and uh, uh, I'll, I'll just repeat it. So um, having, uh, I, I, do, I do have done lobbying. I, I do believe that lobbyists are worth their, their pay. Um, that, uh, but I do, uh, having us moving forward in this, the way we have been moving forward, um, I saw, uh, I saw advice from um, the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. There's an attorney that's been up there the entire time that, that I've been on that board. Uh, he's probably been with them 20 some years. I, I described the situation. Uh, he agreed that it, the city should have a lobbyist, but he said that the timing is probably not, um, that we're, we're kind of rushing. Uh, his suggestion was that we uh, keep talking about this, keep moving forward, that he said that probably that, 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 that since, since session is basically wrapping up, that 
it would be most prudent to basically keep moving forward, put out a request for proposal uh, so that everyone's given a fair shot at, 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 at it and that uh, to go ahead and have someone hired by the fall, by the autumn, when... Uh, that the budget will be done by then. We need to be up there before then. Well, I'm just saying please, what... Please, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just saying, I apologize. I'm just saying what I'm, uh, you know, what I was told by someone that I respect. Understood. And, and I do, as, as we're moving forward and knowing where this started, where we've gone, uh, you know, I mean, I know that the, the, an individual came up and offered to do it for 40, uh, you know, um, not that that's anything right or wrong with that. Um, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, this was advice that I was given from someone that I respect mm -hmm. uh, and admire. Uh, so I see where we're heading. Everything that we've been watching is being amended. Uh, I, I've been watching the the uh, vacation rental is being amended. Uh, some of the stuff that I saw that was dangerous is being amended. So I, I don't, um, my, my vote is gonna be that I'm, I'm gonna just take the advice of uh, uh, a, a, a senior lawyer that was giving me advice from Tampa Bay Region Planning Council. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Ms. Coachman. <clears throat> Pardon me if I tuned out when you were re reading the um, letter, but the lobbyists correct this particular company they are known to lobby the most for any particular thing like I mean is it they I mean will they do it all you know in terms of CRA type funding and you know when when we began this discussion I started calling individuals that I knew in in state government and there were certain names that came rising to the top and I believe Mr. Callahan at one of our workshops shared so, several of those names um, I happened to have a contact that got me in contact with two of the groups Ballard appeared to be the one that was the most um, they responded quickly they got got back with me they spoke about not only doing the lobbying for this legislative session, but also following through with the executive part of it, which is making sure if there's, there's things that we want to see the governor sign, making sure that that stays in front of the, of the governor, that we have representation with that, working with de the development of the state budget and any requests that we may have mm. to go in there as well as making us aware of uh, grants that we should be applying for that we would qualify for again working all the way up to and through this next legislative session so we would have although i would, had hoped that we would get someone engaged before now we will have someone there if council so chooses with this legislative session following what the legislature does in front of the governor getting the information to the governor seeing what the governor signs working with the budget working with identifying grants that we may be available to receive and then working with us to develop our platform for next year's session because next year's session will start in january mm -hmm. so it's a one-year contract and it will follow through the end of Jan or the end of this session and i ask so what happens if you know we have another strain of covid that comes up or something happens in the legislative session doesn't finish when you anticipate it will would you be willing because this is one of the one of the questions that someone had would they be willing to work with us then a month to month until that session was over and yes they've agreed to that so they've they've agreed to everything that we've asked that they would do they've put things forward that I didn't even know enough to ask about mm -hmm. And now, after speaking with um, our mayor and our city administrator, they came down $5,000 off of the price that I had been originally told when they just sent a ver what they could, their proposal to us. And that information has been shared and has been shared with you for some time now. 
um, if I might comment as well. Also, in addition, I, the research that I saw about Ballard Partners, I believe they also have federal, people that do federal um, consulting as well. So if there's questions regarding stimulus money or even, you know, housing authority money, um, I, I, that's why I like having going to a bigger firm because you have more expertise in more areas. And as far as next year's session, the session's in January, but they'll start having the committee meetings in September. So, um, I mean, timing, the timing is, is, uh, is my concern. How far and behind the, the eight ball are we? Well, well, I think for this year, you know, it's pretty much going forward, but um, it would start, and again, I like what Ms. Barnaby said about being in front of the governor, too. Even though we didn't get a lot to set up a platform for us this year, we're still going to be able to flow it through and get into next year. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I just wanted to respond to Mr. Sanders, I agree with you from the standpoint of going out, and I did do other research. I was tasked to do this with Ballard Partners, but I reached out to several others of people that I know in the political world as well as in that, and then um, some of it was looked up that there's going to be some lobbyists that are more connected in areas, there's going to be, and as far as on the ground in Tallahassee, there's going to be some more connected to individual leadership right now, which obviously changes year to year. We had a great connection to our leadership last year, the Senate president, we could make a phone call. Now that's gone away, so um, I don't disagree with some of the RFPing and doing some of that, but again, I was tasked to do one thing, is to get information from Ballard Partners if they would do the 12 months, as well as the price to negotiate it down. The, the, that's Mr. fine. As long as we so, do right. future forward, we, we can do right. the same thing because right. I may I may want to negotiate some well, things that's, too. That's the pleasure and of so the board. That, right. Absolutely. So, yeah. so you have we'll it. May you have somebody in the audience who wants to speak? Right. Right. Well, let's just hold on. Finish the discussion here. Well, um, any further discussion, Mr. Roth? Well, I mean, the other, the other thing that I'm just uh, I, I mean, I, I like I said, I I, I like the concept. I, I'm just. Uh, it, I know that people are saying the timing is everything, and I, I, I say the timing is everything because we've kind of missed the boat, in my opinion. Um, the, uh, you know, I know that uh, the Mantee County, it just the delegation just went up to, um, uh, you know, lobby Tallahassee, which I've done many times, and they weren't, they, they were denied entry, um, you know, because of COVID. Uh, Tallahassee shut down. I mean, it's it's not only is it not known for practicing sunshine but this year the doors are locked so i just don't know that where where i mean some people are taking advantage of COVID. i'm not going to say anyone's doing that but some people are using COVID as an excuse to to get away with stuff they would have liked to have done anyway and i just uh um you know I, having just heard from county the county uh, representatives going up there who are well connected these are people that are well connected. They they know the players, and they weren't allowed in the building. Now they did meet with the Senate President himself and the, the well, House not, of the Speaker. It, so. But they it's did not get into the building. It's not well. It's not it's not the same as, as working the halls because you know you, you've got to you've got to go around and and you get you get you can't just get one or two. I I've gone up there and talked to one or two people and had them. And they met with local change change, change their story. So I just I just think that yes timing timing is an, an issue, and I, I think that we kind of got at this a little too late, mm -hmm. and and the, you know a request for proposal would be the proper way of doing it. There's nothing wrong with what you've done, and I don't disagree that you you know we headed in that direction. You did work. I'm not <coughs> criticizing anything on no, that. I, I'm just saying I was glad to do it, and like yeah. I said, I might probably agree with you. So. Uh, but I don't have a vote in this. So. Okay. And uh, we were we were behind the eight ball from the time we started, and we knew that, right. and that's why we kept trying to I, move I this forward. I um, and well, we've I, discussed I, it now at, yeah. to, by my count, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, three workshops and three council meetings, all properly noticed meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say from the the mayor's office, I believe that all the ideas we've talked about are good i think either way we go are going to benefit us in, in a positive for the next so i mean again it's individual 
yes or no votes, and that's going to be important for your decision. And that's and, and there's no, I don't think there's a loser in this all long term. Maybe a little bit at the beginning, but again, we can ask the staff to RFP it right away, get somebody in and get them in quicker than not if we need to, if uh, we decide not to do this. But I think there's benefit, there's there's merits to both, but it's going to be obviously your decision. So. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, we're going to move forward with the vote. We're going to start in Ward 4. Yes, this is one to speak. There's nobody up. Yeah, Mr. Gallo, okay, we'll allow, allow Mr. Gallo, uh, citizen comment or anyone in the audience. Anyone? Please state your name and not credentials for the record, but your address. My name is Gene Gallo. I live at 6607 27th Avenue West in Ward 1. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to share my experience. I lobbied for 12 years when I was a fire chief. In fact, I, sent, I set up the first group of lobbyists for fire chiefs. I had two fire chiefs in Tallahassee every Monday starting the week during the session. And there's some things that I learned. Number one, you very seldom get to speak to a representative. You speak to their aides. Number two, I learned that if you went up as a city, which we have, what, 67 cities? Counties. Or 567 cities. 412. That if you went up on an issue by for just your city, you know how much time you're going to get from a, from a legislator? That much. What we found out, what we did was when we found out that there were bills that, they, that affected a certain city, we were sure that the fire chiefs from that community were the ones that went up there and spoke to them. And we used our, our elected legislators to speak to another legislator. And we use the Florida League of Cities. And I believe if we pay for the Florida League of Cities, Carl. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know how much we yeah. pay? As we pay our league? annual membership dues. You know what that, how much that is? I, am not, I don't remember right off the top of my head. But I'm just saying, I, I think it's very seldom that the city of Bradenton is going to be the only city that something affects. And so you have the Florida League that will be in there fighting your battles. You have some great legislators that will fight your battles. And to me, to spend $60,000 for maybe is there's that amount of money should and could be spent somewhere else in the city that it's really needed now. And if some issue comes up, I assume that you could find a lobbyist for that particular issue and not have to worry about spending that kind of money. But uh, what's really effective is for you guys to go to Tallahassee and you go speak to the legislature. I remember talking to a representative at St. Pete about a bill that was affecting everybody in the state of Florida in the fire service. And she told me, she said, that's the stupidest damn bill I've ever heard in my life. She said, who is sponsoring that thing? I'll go talk to him. I said, you are. She had no idea. Her age set it all up. So. You know, there's a lot of games up there. They'll take a taxi bill and hire uh, uh, and put something in there for the, that affects the police department. That's the reason why we had somebody there every Monday to review the bills and to lobby. Thank you. Can I, can I just say? Ms. Coker. Completely agree with what he's saying, but that's exactly why you have to have someone to help you open some of those doors and help you know where to find those grants and, and things like that. And um, the reason the county was able to meet with some of the people that they did is because they had a consultant that opened those doors for them. Right, thank you. Please state your name. And Glenn Jablina, for the record, um, I agree with Patrick. This was uh, this wasn't well. This wasn't very well thought out. This session is over. There's you're get zero help this session. I will tell you that. Uh, the Manatee County did come back. Uh, they couldn't get in. Lobbyists are important, but how you, about, how you go about retaining them is equally important. 
Here's my suggestion is put a PRFR out, interview some lobbyists. Nobody, they're in session right now. They, they're not going to do anything for you. They're not going to sit down with you and say, what are your concerns? You are wasting your money if you hire a lobbyist right now. Second thing I want to bring up, if you wait till the summer, I'm not saying until the fall, summer, you will have a platform that you can present to them and say, here are our issues, you know, our sewer, affordable housing, whatever it is. And I'm a numbers guy, and I'm a facts guy. So I would ask these lobbyists, okay, you're in the running. Tell me what, like cities, you have helped and what you've done for them. And then you call those cities up and say, hey, we're thinking about this lobbyist. Are they any good? Oh, no, they, they just took our money and ran. Or no, they're the best thing since sliced bread. Facts and numbers, you haven't done that yet. You haven't done that yet. I so I would say, <laughs> I would say that you, you wait till the summertime, you interview the people you can, because right now nobody's gonna, nobody, nobody's gonna stop what they're doing up there now and say, hey, we wanna come and negotiate. That's not, they're not gonna help you this year. It's a waste of money. And then additionally too, if you do it in the summer, now you've got a whole year with this guy, with this firm, they've gone through the session, have they been effective? Did they say, did they do what they were gonna say they were gonna do after you've done your homework? So you will give them one full session to say, here's, here's our platform, did you follow through with it? Are we happy with you? We wanna renew it? Or we, 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 here was our platform, you didn't meet our goals, and there you go. That's, that's my concern. That, that would be the logical way to do it, and I'm with Mr. Gallo. Um, you know, you, you don't need to rush into this. They will do zero for you this year. Thank you. And uh, the one thing that I do believe that, uh, you know, there's been some research done on this. There's been some information. So some of the facts that, that sometimes come out may not be the facts you like, but I believe that people have done research and this is a good company. It's nothing, we're not talking about this company in particular because right. they may come back in RFP and right. be the one we pick if right. we decide to go that right. direction. But I just think that it's something that we obviously had a pretty brand new council and mayor January, so we were behind the eight ball starting out, and now this is a discussion we're having. So, yes, sir, Mr. Callahan. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Just for, in the for what it's worth file. The only thing that I would like to see you all do from my perspective is um, start earlier than anybody is recommending. Okay, whatever you do, whether you select to go RFP, you almost come out of this process and get going with that process. And the reason I say that is compared to a normal year, and I think Mr. Sanders and I talked about this yesterday, there are going to be millions and millions and millions of dollars thrown around Tallahassee, Washington, that we want to make sure we get our hands on. Mm -hmm. And I used the perfect example of the CDBG and SHIP resiliency program that we had some great projects that we sent up to Tallahassee to try to figure out funding. I mean, we sent, they, they were as resilient as you can get. <laughs> and when it was all said and done, the governor's list comes out. It doesn't come out from the legislators. It comes out from the governor. The governor's list of those projects that were selected, zero. Zero. And there were probably 40 cities listed that got money. That's why I'm saying as soon as we can get into this ball game, I think we need to get in it. I'm not saying when necessarily, but we need to get in it quickly because I think we're missing the boat from those types of dollars, not the VRBO, not what are you doing in my backyard, something. I think from those dollars, we need to get on board quickly. I'm only going to say from the research. Ballard is a very reputable municipal entity that represents a lot of people. So if you're interested in going that route, I think they would be great. If you're interested in waiting, the only things you're going to have to do to make sure you move quickly are you, will, you guys will not be in a position probably to review every RFP that came in. So you're going to probably need to set up a committee that would review those. Do some research on them. Are these people what they say they are so that you can get it down to a number that you can actually deal with pretty quickly. Because if you sit out an RFP for lobbyists 
Have you seen the list? I mean, it is hundreds and hundreds of lobbyists. So to, to get into that, pro you, will, you will be inundated with that. So you need to set up your process very quickly if that's the way. That's, that's it from my sense. Ballard's, I, I think, is a, is a great company. I've talked to Matt Forrest at length about what they can do, what they do, what our options are. Like everybody says, I think our options are very limited as far as legislative session. But when you get beyond the session and into earmarking of monies, monies that's going to be flowing down that they're not even sure what Florida is getting yet, that we want to be in line with, with our fair share. So that's so. however we get there, let's get there, I think, from your perspective. Because let's, let's get what we need for the city, whether it's CDBG, whether it's just money that, uh, that we're going after an appropriation in the future. Um, just make sure that we're we're in line doing the right thing. So, Mr. so thank Callahan, you for your time. I, I, and I had brought you a name that I had got from somebody that you did some research and, and like I said earlier, they may have been politically connected, but they weren't very city connected. So, you know, there was some research done looking out there. Uh, there's ones I talked to another firm that uh, probably was very similar to Ballard mm -hmm. that that reached out to me because they had heard we were doing this and I you know spent a lot of time with them and so there's going to be like you said there's going to be several companies that probably could do all the same but there's going to be some that in other ways will be out there that might not be something that we pick but there was on that website there's hundreds there's going to be people that are better than others right. obviously there's people that are more connected than others that's that's the name that's what they rely on that's how they differentiate themselves is who are they connected to are they connected to old school no longer in power no longer really or are they connected with the up-and-comers I don't know which one's the best but you know that's how did how are they getting their associations I mean we had we had a firm right in here today Greg Herring works for Gray Robinson Gray Robinson has lobbyists they are our lobbying effort as well we don't use them for that we use them obviously for, for our labor attorneys but they um, Dean Cannon is a former what speaker I think I mean, our president of the Senate, I mean, he's, I forget which one of those two he is, but that's who heads up their lobby. And those are the, those are the people that are either lawyers before they ever came out, went to the legislature, came back, set out their time before they can be lobbyists, and are now lobbyists. So, so that's all. Uh, and thanks for your time. I'm just, yeah. just as how we progress, I think either way we need to, we need to get going. If we're going to, if we're going to do it at all, we need to get going. Great discussion. Mr. Roth. So, so my, what, what, to reiterate what I'm basically, I'm, I, I believe we should move forward as quickly as possible. We had some realtors come in and wanted to, and talk to us about the rows. Well, we haven't decided on that either. So, yeah. so that's just the way we do things. We don't just, okay, let's just vote, Joe you know, Bing. So, um, you know, for the sake of, we've never had a lobbyist before, I've suggested I suggested a lobbyist 10 years ago. No one wanted to hear it. Um, so now that we are moving forward, just rather than having talked to, you know, we had one person came in and, and, and we knew and, and we didn't move forward with that. Then another person comes in. I haven't talked to them. I, I, and I, I, I respect you talking to them. That's fine. I would just like to say as we're moving forward, just in case someone criticizes us for choosing a lobbyist, um, that you know we say well we we put out a bid we uh you know we we did it the legal proper way and we chose this person and and i don't i i think these these people would be fabulous i i don't know that um you know i mean i wouldn't be opposed to it it's just the, the how we get there and uh you know and 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 time did slip away and that's time's been slipping away on me my whole life so you know here i am now just trying to do the right thing on this and and uh and I agree with Mr. Callahan. It's, it's, I'm not saying put it off. I was told to keep moving forward. If uh, you made, you made a good point, Carl, um, you know, uh, sooner, sooner than later. So instead of voting on this up and down one person, put out, immediately put out a request for proposal and set up the process to expedite it. And I was told and have someone in place by fall, by autumn, by the end of summer to, to have someone ready to go. by. that is, in my, in my, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, we have we have a motion, so we're getting a final discussion. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Barnaby. If we wait until fall, it's too late. We need to have representation 
if not now, pretty close to now, with the money that is coming down out of Washington through the state, with the process by which the state budget is put together, it's done over the summer. So if we wait until fall, it's, t it's w again, it's too late. Well, and I don't necessarily mean by fall. I'm saying put out a request for proposal. How quickly can we get this done? If we could, if we could do it as quick as possible, and instead of just voting on one name up and down, that's all I'm saying is it's it, sooner, sooner than better. I mean, I would have liked to have had a planning director a year ago. Moving on. <laughs> soon, so. All right, any further discussion? If there's an amendment to <coughs> this uh, uh, motion, does the amendment get voted on first? Mm -hmm. Or well, did they just or does it have she made her motion, so the I motion understand. includes it. No, I said it. if I made oh, an oh, amendment. If you made an amendment. Okay. If I made an amendment. Only, only the maker of the motion can amend it. Only you can, su can you could amend suggest it. an amendment if you want, but only the maker of the motion can amend. Well, I suggest that we uh, put an RFP on this. We can do it immediately and and have it uh, voted on by the uh, sometime in June. Uh, and I don't see that we would probably even need one if there is not discussion in Tallahassee about infrastructure. I just don't see that. It, I think it's a waste of our money to do so. And if we're going to do that, I would propose if we got $55,000 extra money sitting around that we could take the top full-time employees, the bottom 55, and give them each a $1,000 raise. Can I call my own motion to question? Am well, I allowed to have, do that? You have a, it, it, I don't, I'm not going to make that amendment, no. Okay, okay. So she's not so. accepting that at this time. So. That's good. All right. Um, further discussion before we vote? Oh, you called the, you called the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so the question has been called. We will start the vote in Ward 4. No. 5. No. 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. No. Okay, motion fails. Three to two. All right. So, and again, I think it's it was great discussion. It was great timing to get it going now. But my only thing would be if we can RFP it, get some of the stuff right away, get it to us, and not say June or fall or anything. Let's get it can as soon as possible. Can we make that RFP motion, motion now? Well, I, I suggest. Hold on. I suggested that, and it was denied. So. No, no, no. It was, it was denied on my motion. motion. I, I, so but I suggested moving, that, and forward. that wasn't right. acceptable. Someone no, we, can make a different motion. Yeah, yeah. you can do whatever you want, but I'm still going to add my 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 Please, amendment. Mr. 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 Roth has the floor. I I make a motion that we put out a request for proposal for a lobbyist as soon as possible. Uh, let them know that uh, we're we're looking to move quickly. Um, you know, and that I don't. I'm not going to say that we should even say that we're going to move by June if, if, if we can do it sooner the sooner we can act on this for better I would just like for the sake of, of the taxpayers and the citizens to say I talked to more than one person that's that's all I want to say is and, and we move as quickly as possible and get them um, you know uh, in, in, in in action as quick as possible so would there be a quick excuse me I was going to ask this question if you're making a motion yes would it be possible to and this just can tell me if it's the right way to do it or not, but each individual council person maybe come up with two or three to RFQ to, or because who are we going to RFQ to? We just we put it municipal, out there. Municipal lobbyists. To everybody? everybody? Municipal lobbyists. And then who is going to make the decision of if there's 150 that apply? Probably need some sort of committee that right. would go through that. A chair can probably come from this board, but some other folks to mm -hmm. be able to review those and, and say, at what point do they meet the, the qualifications? You're going to, your RFQ is not going to say y'all come. It's going to say, do you have municipal experience? Do you have mm -hmm. right. you know, those types of things? That you, and we will have to look up. There, there's obviously RFPs out there. We'd have to look and see what other folks have done in the RFP realm for lobbyists. My guess is Manatee County does theirs by that form. 
uh, would be just a guess. Longboat Key probably does. Just the locals of the League of Cities may have a template. And the League, League may mm. have a template. And, and I know that uh, um, the islands, uh, you know, uh, but, but I think one of the islands has a lobbyist or if not. What I, what I want you to be able to do is when you get those in, not get bogged down then in a protracted process to right. trying to select one, which is with a huge amount of them, that could be the case. It's more, let's try to get it narrowed down. If you can get it down to four or five, and then you guys can just decide. Because you're going to select four or five really good ones. I mean, that's, it, there's, a, there's a lot of good ones out there. So my guess is you would get down to that. As, as quickly as possible, weed it down to municipal experience. Do you have any local, uh, you know, contacts, how effective you are, and as quickly as possible. And if it winds up that these people that uh, we're talking to are, are the top choice, I'm all for it. I, I'd like to just weed it down to, let's say, the top five and, uh, and, and move as quickly as possible. So who do you want to lead that? Um, was Mrs. Coker's original initiative? Mm -hmm. I think she probably. Yeah, had to I, be I, have, I have no problem with if, if someone, if someone on the board wants to do it, if they want staff to do it. I really, how, how we, how we do it is not, you know, other than, other than just quickly voting on a choice, just for the sake of, uh, you know, the way we do bids on anything. You know, we just have a few names and then we choose one. It's just looks better. Uh, I, I'll do whatever. The soon, whatever will help facilitate okay. this the most efficient way, I'm, I'll be happy to if, do that. If it. you volunteer to, to do that, that's, Absolutely. I, I, I would accept your expertise in that. With uh, Carl's assistance. Absolutely. <laughs> whatever, staff, whatever staff you need. Okay. Do we still need a second? For a second? A second. All right. Well, Mr. Roth has a motion and Mrs. Coachman has a second. Any further discussion? Yes. Okay, Mr. Sanders. I and Carl discussed this at length yesterday, and we agreed, I think we agreed, uh, at least I thought we agreed, <laughs> that the lobbyists would only be to our benefit is if we were getting an infrastructure bill that Tallahassee is going to fight over it, we need some representation that other issues are not that important to us. I don't think only. I said that is to me the most important thing is if there's monies out there to get because that's when you take $55,000 and turn it into five million. It's not, I don't know what's coming up if you, if when you come up with a legislative agenda, I'm talking, I was talking interim right now. If you come up with a legislative agenda between now and next session that you think there's things that are very significant to the city of Bradenton, or you come up with a requested appropriation that you're asking them to, to, to sign on for, then I think you, you need a lobbyist that's going to say, like I said, very similar to the pirates. Pirates use Ron Pierce to shepherd their request through, and that was from start I to finish. Understand, but don't you always have to have a need before you make a purchase? I would say that yes, but I would In say life. the city has a the potential of a need. Well, because there's nobody filling we that haven't had role one now. For we have never had one. But that doesn't mean, well, that doesn't mean we've been right because we haven't had one. Well, it doesn't mean we've been wrong either. No, I'm just saying, it doesn't mean. So we, we agree so we that can, there are We can play needs. this back and forth, but again, it's money. It's $55,000, and I don't see, personally, I don't see that we're going to gain anything by it. And I'd like to see that if, if, if we want to do this, then let's give the, the, uh, the, the bottom 55 full-time employees a $1,000 raise this year if we've got $55,000 laying around. That's, that's a, I'd, like to, I'd like to throw that in as part of the deal. Mr. Sanders, I'm negotiating for employees now. That's unfair to put that on the rest no, of the No, it's not unfair. It's, I don't, it's, a decision and I don't think that's because, a discussion on the motion. Right, yeah, right so. Now. Well, that's my discussion. Did you, 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 you say okay. call the question or? I'll, I'll call the question. Okay, that's what I thought. I didn't know if I heard that or discussion, so I wanted to make sure. Well, just, the question's been called to RFQ is with Ms. Coachman being Kind of the lead with the staff on that. Coker. No, Coker. Oh, oh Coker, I'm sorry. Ms. Coachman Sounds made similar. the second, so she wanted to get into more. So. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. Mrs. Coker taking the lead on that to bring it back as soon as possible to further discussion for the seventh time, at least. So, um, all right, uh, start the vote in Ward 5. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Three. Yes. Four. No. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Again, I think it's good discussion, and, and sometimes we started out a little bit late because of the new council, so we're moving forward. Um, all right, the other the couple things I have, um, but the first one, um, it's come to, to my attention, brought to us by some of our friends on um, Third Avenue. They would like, if possible, and I don't know exactly the logistics of it, Mr. Callahan can tell us some of it, but um, they would like to symbolically have that as Avenue of the Arts, starting at 10th, going to 1st, which is, in, encompasses the Bishop, the Arts Center, and the Performing Arts. Um, I know other cities around us and do it, called Boulevard of the Arts or different ways, but just to try to market, and I saw Carla was here, they had to leave probably for timing, but, um, you know, and it wouldn't be changing the street name from 3rd Avenue, but it would be kind of renaming it Village of, or uh, Avenue of the Arts, so they can market and do things as they go forward. Um, it came up at a campaign event, and I guess it had come up before, but, you know, I mean, I just wanted to bring it up and see the logistics and how we do that. So, Mr. Rolf? Yeah, I, it's funny. Um, I suggested this uh, to, to Carl. I don't think it ever left Carl's office, but back when the Manatee players were heading to Palmetto, and I went over and met with them, um, uh, and they weren't, let's just say it was a hostile meeting, uh, and then um, we negotiated to, I think the city has never gotten enough recognition for all the work that's been put into making the current player site possible. That it was, it was a lot of, to be quite honest, uh, Carl, Carl was doing some arm twisting with the partners over there to, to give them, to give up the land. And that uh, my proposal was at the time that we, that we do that, and I said at the time too, that because it's not just the players, it's the it's the art league which is going to be looking for a land uh, uh, transaction as well. And I, and I said that this would be Carl, the avenue of the arts. <laughs> so it's it's a, it's a great idea. <laughs> so, but again, I'm, I'm as you know, we're in a new administration yeah. and we're yes, bringing absolutely. up positive yeah. things to I, absolutely. No, I, so. I I thought it was so a great idea. Is that from First Street uh, East or West? Tenth. East? East. Tenth first, East, okay. First, right. And again, we could have, I mean, third ends down on what, uh, 15th, I think it is? Well, so, the reason we'd already, the, we'd, we'd already kind of renamed that well, str no. street. Bob Bart's way goes this way. This would be the other way. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so. Um, you have two yeah, signs on top. Yeah, it is too. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a, it's a market. Yeah, but that thing. goes to, to, to first, right? Okay, yeah, this so goes to first. Didn't want to offend that family by taking away their name. So Bob Parts goes from Baccarat to right here. Right here. That's pretty much it on 10th. And the other would go east west. Are we, are we renaming Third Avenue? Not We're not renaming, renaming it. We're just are, symbolically saying so they can put on marketing. But Third Avenue. Yeah, Third yeah, Avenue yes, from 10th yes, yes. to 1st. Because it ends right okay. there at the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it hits all three of the, great the bishop, it's, it's the entrance all of way them. to the Riverwalk right. Park. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, no, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I, I mean, that, is there any? We need a motion is there any? to just kind of proceed, or do I we think just it's say? A motion because it wasn't an official naming, so you're right. not going through the post office, you're right. not going through all that because you don't want people to have to change their addresses no. and mess all we that up. That. But the way we did it with Bob Bartz, it was <laughs> yeah. very symbolic right. that you put it out there so people can see it above the Third Avenue. Do you need a motion? Need a motion. So. Well, it's not my ward, but I would be happy to second a motion as the former president of Art Center Manatee. But it's not. Oh, I'll make the motion. Okay, oh. thank you. Second, Miss Barnaby. Yep. All right. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All. Well, I can say all in favor. But I'll start the vote in Ward One. Yes. Ward Two. Yes. Three. Yes. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. Thank you very much. They'll be happy. Um, the last thing I just want to bring up, food for thought, we are getting towards the end of March. So that's three months into this year. There's nine months before the end of the year. We have another retirement happening at the end of the year in the fire chief. So, so we don't get behind the eight ball on things and we're trying to progress. Um, I believe that, um, in my opinion, there might be an in-house candidate that we need to move the process forward, maybe doing in-house first, um, which again, as we know, if we go with the consultant, that cost us some dollars. If there's a way to do that process, 
Mr. Callahan, how would that process happen? I think you may be a little bit early on that, if from, but certainly I think as, as always when you have those openings, you want to advertise in-house first, which we did even with the administrator. We advertised it in-house. And, and then you see what you get from that perspective. Um, and, and if you don't get the candidates that you want, your next option would be to do our traditional advertising um, that we do through Florida Fire Chiefs, through a lot of other mechanisms that you could look at. And then the third would be to hire a consultant. Um, I don't know that you have to go, you don't need to go right to the consultant. I think the reason we did out on PCD is we'd kind of gone the other avenues and hadn't gotten there. So I think there's some ways to look at whether you have in-house candidates by once you decide to open it up. I mean, it, everybody's aware, I think, that, that Chuck is leaving, but it, the timing is needs to be pretty soon that you would at least advertise that, in, at least in-house in that posting. So that the people who are at the firehouse know that if they're interested, they need to say so. You can't come back after the fact and say, well, I didn't think about that, I wasn't sure. And you can let that sit for a while, you know, and see if there's any responses. Nope, that's why I brought it up, even though it may be a little early, we always seem to be, yeah, we're, we don't wanna be, we don't want to get on fire with like some of the other things we're in now, so no pun intended, so. <laughs> that was very intended. <laughs> Yes, sir. I mean, I, I, I think I've already spoke to the chief about this and, and uh, you know, come to the, I have an opinion on it. Um, so, but my, my thinking is, because if we decide we're not going to do in-house, then we do go out and it take, that takes, that takes a lot of time. So the appropriate time is now so that we can um, uh, know whether we're going to have to start the process. Perfect. No, that's all I have. I do have one question. Just notice here that Mr. Gibellina had given us a card on presentation. Was there something else that was all well, the other stuff we've already talked about? I thought that there was going to be something on our Oh, no, no. That no. was last meeting. That's no. in lunch ago. Yep. So, all right, thank you. Um, department heads, we'll start with Fire Chief. Nothing. Jim, anything else? Um, just real quick. Um, as we speak, the kickoff meeting for the construction work associated with the Riverwalk extension is happening right now. So you'll start to see activity on a more frequent basis associated with that. Happy to have that happening. Um, I also got this morning notification that the contractor is mobilizing today and will be working through Saturday to make the additional repairs at the judicial parking garage. That is not one that requires the garage to be closed, just the certain areas to be fenced off, but that will be completed by the end of this week. Um, uh, also, I know you had sent me the question. Uh, I have a draft comprehensive CIP put together. I'm kind of finalizing some of the numbers in it. Uh, looking at it from a five-year standpoint, I've got about $60 million of projects in there that it covers everything from Stormwater, streets, paving, sidewalk replacement, uh, street lights, um, park improvements, seawall repairs. Um, I've tried to cover the game. So uh, we'll be in a position at the workshop next week to present some, some detailed information, several of which will be what would be deemed shovel ready, meaning that if somebody said, here's a check, if you've got a project ready to go, we've got several that would fall, qualify underneath that. Thank you. Thank you. What, Jim? Yes, sir. Um, going back to, because I, I was looking at this uh, property we talked about, 111 22nd Street West, you mentioned a storm drain under there. Mm -hmm. uh, having canoed that creek quite extensively, I believe that's a lot more than a storm drain. I think that is oh, That's that, a big pipe. It, that's where, like, the, there's two four footers that dump out there. Yeah. Is no, that I, not? I, I, it, it probably takes up the full width of that property. Absolutely. I, I, I don't think there's anything we can do i mean it's not just a storm pipe that's like a correct flood control system <laughs> <laughs> it, it handles a, a significant amount of flow from the western portion yeah of the I, I i don't think we can do anything with that property but okay. thank you sharon might be a good storm just a quick minute. reminder you have a workshop scheduled for next wednesday the 31st and we will be putting an agenda together probably today in our office 
Um, and that's all I have. And, and if we, <laughs> there could be a, a lengthy time on some of that agenda items next week, so it, it could be a longer workshop than normal, so, which is good. Get some information out there. Um, Scott, anything? Okay. Chief? All right, thank you. Mr. Callahan? Yes, I do. Can't let you get out there. Mm -hmm. I think because it's, uh, it's, it's something people have been asking for, you know, we do have preliminary information on the American Rescue Plan. You know, we sent out information that said we thought we'd be receiving around $11 million of funding. Uh, from what we've learned so far, that will come in two tranches, the first half sometime in May, the second half maybe six months later. Um, it's not just spend on what you want to. Uh, there's some restrictions that come with that. You know, what, what's in the legislation, which is that's the actual bill, that's the actual House bill that, that talks about it. But the descriptions of, of what you can ultimately spend the money are, on are, are clear right now, but I think they're going to be more clearly defined as we, as we move forward. And some of the, the use of that money by description is to respond to public health emergency with respect to the coronavirus or uh, its negative economic impacts, including assistance to households, small businesses, not-for-profits, or impacted industries, including tourism, whatever else. So this ability to reach out into the community and spend some of those, those dollars. I think, like I said, more details will come on that. Um, the second option is to respond to $1,000. Here it comes or more, <clears throat> to respond to workers performing essential work during COVID, okay? Uh, the public health emergency by providing premium pay to eligible workers in municipalities in an entitlement community. All the definitions in this are, we are an entitlement community, which means we're a metropolitan area by definition. The metropolitan areas, those are 50,000 or greater. So up to a hourly um, rate and an amount you can pay for the premium wages for the work that was done during the COVID. Um, certainly looking at limitations on that, obviously, because you could spend all of your money on that, doing that, or some, some way to look at it um, logically across the board. As, we, as you know, virtually all of our people were here working. So that's a, that's a natural progression to that. Uh, the state is looking at giving uh, uh, law enforcement or I think public safety a thousand dollars so ours would be inclusive of that whatever if we decide to do something I think not double up but certainly could could look at that if, if the council is so inclined um, and for provision provision of government service to the extent reduction in revenue in the metropolitan city us um, to revenues collected in the most recent full year to consider 2019. So we have a couple areas, if you recall, that we saw the gas tax reduction. We saw a little bit in municipal revenue sharing. Not tons of money, but it will help make, if you want to help make those funds full as far as especially like transportation um, going forward to make sure that those were consistent with that. And then um, last but not least is to make necessary investments in water, sewer, and broadband improvements and I think a lot of this is geared toward broadband um, to be able to make uh, the feds are looking at those underserved communities that don't have broadband at all I mean they there is there's a ton of this country that out in the middle of nowhere the companies are not interested in making broadband available because it doesn't make economic sense and they're being pushed that way and this is just an incentive to be able to help try to do that um, some things it's not is you can't shore up your pensions by using these monies. There's some things they've already clearly come out and said you can't do, and, and that's one of them. Um, you're really not trying to supplant. You're trying to find n new things to, to make economic drivers. And so the water sewer could be a big issue for us, uh, certainly helping in transportation with the replenishment of some of those funds that we lost through the, through the two months that they just didn't pay. And, uh, and then looking at whether you want to look at essential workers. So we'll get more details, uh, but one of the things that we'll work on in accounting is setting up a fund to account for all this stuff, because that'll be a big piece. They'll come out with more rules than we can probably shake a stick at as to how we have to report on it. So accounting will be responsible for receiving it in and then keeping track of it. So we'll get started on those right away and then hope for the wire transfer and, and then some more rules. But in the meantime, we can start thinking about things that we've, we would like to do. I've tasked Jim with that. That's part of the reason for the large capital plan is to say where you want to go 
and then dovetail that in what you're looking at in CRAs as well as we're coming right up on our next budget. So, so that's just a thumbnail update on it because I know the questions are there. Every time we find out something, we'll continue. I'll, my process from here on out will just be send you the emails because trying to explain it is sometimes they don't want to get it wrong. Let you guys read it when we see it, and and we can go from there. So right, thanks. I, I think we'll we'll develop over time over the next 60 days. And that's the reason I wanted Jim to be prepared to have some shovel-ready stuff uh, because it does mention specifically water, sewer, and, and, and that. And so we need to be in front of it rather than, you know, behind it. And uh, I think it's ironic that, uh, and I'm with Ms. Coachman on this now, I wish that I'd have voted the other way, but uh, that you have an employee that works in our public works that, that you know, didn't want to work overtime in a COVID in 11 years and we release him but now there's money that we might be able to pay him i think that's just pretty ironic you know and and, and you know maybe we can use some of this money I and mean, maybe maybe there'll be some details and maybe some of those people that, that were, one of the biggest departments we had with covid i believe it was public works when well, you didn't you have like 20 some odd people out at one time yeah so if there's money available let's 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 give it to them you know, if if you have thousand dollars a piece or whatever, we can decide on the number. But it sounds like there's some money there. Let's let's do it. I wish that yeah. I'd have went to that merit board. I, I I don't I don't know why the union didn't back him up, but since they didn't and there was nobody here representing him today, that's the reason I asked the question. Um, I would have had somebody here, but that's just me. Um, that's. For y'all to decide if that's something you want to do, I know staff from our perspective likes the idea because of the morale. It's been a tough year for folks. Yeah, so, absolutely. And, and we had a lot of people without question stepping up and saying, well, we didn't ask them if they wanted to work. There's a few. There's some that were provisional and weren't working, but for the most part, everybody had to work. They weren't given a choice to say, just don't come in unless, of course, you had symptoms or were sick because the expectation is our services went on as if nothing happened. And that, that's a good thing. That's something to be proud of, that our services went forward as if there was nothing out there, even though we know it was a serious issue. So. Right, and I want to remind everybody again, this board uh, approved pay raises, and I've talked to Melanie about it, uh, for, the, for the police department last year, and we was right in the middle of COVID, and we could have just as easily said no, because, <clears throat> You know, we would, we was looking at loss of revenue, and it had been very easy to say no. But we said, look, they're out there in the front; they're they're they, they got to go to work. Let's give them the raises. So that's the decision that we made on that. It was a good decision, uh, and do the same thing again. But so now that we're getting this funding, uh, there's some, probably some people we need to take care of. Yeah, Mr. Roth. Yeah, um, I, I, Carl, I, I agree that we should go forward, and I think the lesson that should be learned was back when the BP oil spill happened, um, there was a basically a list. Uh, did you want to put your name on the list? And there was, unfortunately, I, I just had back surgery. Had I known this was, it was not on the agenda. It was brought up by the city attorney at the time, and head-scratchingly, three people voted no to not put their name on the list. And to, years later, it turned out that it was millions and millions and millions of dollars that was free for the taking. Um, so this is what's happening right now that, uh, you know, the money, I think it's gonna, I think by the time we get, I mean, that took years before the, that BP money shifted down through the county and we figured out what it was. I think it's gonna be the same thing. I think there's good, the, the, the bill that just got passed, uh, you know, in, in the, um, in Washington is now going to be fought over in, in uh, you know, Tallahassee and then the counties are going to get, it's, it's going to be a food fight, but I think that we should, you know, get ready for the, let's get, let's get up to the table, let's get ready for the fight and let's just try to get as much as we can. Yeah, the food fight will be over the state funding. The right. State funds that's passed down. These right. come directly to us. Yeah, right. these are, these are, this these are entitlement to us. We'll get the a, next round if it comes about. It's yeah. the money, it's, it's in the same bill that goes to the states, and the states now have to get that money out. They'll be keeping a lot of it for themselves to balance their budget, and, but there's monies that will ultimately go down to the county and, and may trickle down to us that we're going to want to get in that 
frenzy to try to get. Yeah. But certainly this money here is going to be ours to spend without their interference. So I think um, the one thing that is out there is the shovel ready is critical because it needs to be spent by 2024. You need to show that you can spend it the next two and a half years. And we, we know Jim can spend money, so there's, there's no, no problem. problem with that. But it means you've got to get started. You don't want to be lagging out at the end going, well, we're almost done. And we want to. Well, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want to be studying this for the next three. No, years. we want to be we moving. We seem to forward. have a, a real problem in government that we we like to study things till we run out of money. So we're trying I, to break that mold. Okay. So right. that's the goal. I'm here to, to get just shirt. <laughs> get it moving. Get, let's okay. let's get a get a get our priorities together on this, and this is our priorities. And nobody else has to interfere in our priorities. And then we'll try to make sure that they're legal, you know, per the per the parameters. <laughs> so everybody understands it's 11 million now. That that's that's earmarked for us. Yes. It's the the to come. We may not know. We, we may not. It, I'd say in 60 days. If we don't know, it probably is not going to happen. No. What we don't know is how the state will divvy up their states. Whether well, they ever get a. First of all, it has to come out of Washington, but. Oh, it's in the state already. Well, it's they, mean, they've been designated how much they're going to get. There it's just what they do with it now. Oh, are you talking about this current? This current 1.9 billion. Okay. It's it's then any of the trillion. next money. It's trillion. trillion. It's the next three trillion or a transportation or an infrastructure bill that may or may never happen. We don't know on that. But this one's here. What we know we have, and then the opportunity to go after. The state's going to put funding programs out there and be able to go after some of those programs too. That's that's what we want to, all of these together, we want to go get our share on that. So. Ms. Coker. The one thing I would say is um, basically we've sold our children's futures with all this money coming, and it's not by our choice. I hope that we will spend this money with a very futuristic eye on it. What are we leaving our children? The quality of the water, you know, transportation, all of that. I really hope we take this money and spend it on the future because I'm just concerned about the future. <laughs> and I think one of the things Mr. Callahan just said with the 1.9 trillion is going to Tallahassee, the portion of it that we may or may not know what we're getting yet or we may or get zero. You brought up a point earlier where there's shovel-ready projects we sent to Tallahassee and got zero. Maybe if we would have had a lobbyist, we might have got one. So there is some benefit. And I was on this council for seven and a half years and never voted for a lobbyist because I didn't see the need. But I think that we're in a different time now that we might, if we don't evaluate everything we do over and over again, we're never going to make any change, and we need to do that. Um, one other comment I'd like to make um, to, to Mrs. Coachman and, and maybe Mr. Sanders a little bit, but I sat on that merit board for seven years as chairman. We sent things to the council that we thought the employees should be kept at times. We sat through hours. There was one that was almost a week long, and we thought the person should be kept, and the council voted to, you know, fire still. Um, so one of the things that, that in this, we have four supervisors that are our employees that gave him every opportunity to succeed. He didn't take that opportunity, and he had an opportunity to have representation. So sometimes you can throw out innuendos at times of things, but sometimes you look at the facts and, and the situation, and you know I respect our staff that will bend over backwards for our employees, especially our administrative staff, and go from there. So sometimes I don't disagree with the way you feel or your vote. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying sometimes, mm -hmm. you, you know, when you're in a leadership role, you have to look at the overall picture, and that's important. And I l looked at it differently when I was the merit board chairman for seven years and some tough cases. But um, in this role, I respect our staff that does their job from that, and an opportunity was given. So. Um, also, I'd just like to remind everyone on this dais that it's very important that we deal with the staff that we're supposed to. We have a code of conduct. We have things that we're supposed to do. I've asked Scott to do some research for me to go forward. I will be probably bringing something back pretty soon that we as a council, and, and, and maybe it, you'd look outside of our walls in some of the other areas of this county, you know, we're going to be held to a standard that I believe we should stand up to and 
respect our staff and deal with the staff that you're supposed to. We're not here to micromanage, we're here to set policy and we need to do that. The department heads are who we discuss things with. We don't go and give direction to other staff members. That's not right. That's not what's supposed to be done. We are a policy board to set it and work with the department heads. So, you know, just something that, that is very important to me and in this role in two and a half months, I've learned a lot and I just think that's gonna, that's gonna progress our city so we don't maybe look like others where we're trying to impede what's happening. So, it's just a, a statement on mine and I feel that's important, so. Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, ma'am. May I say this? Sure. I respect staff, the supervisors, the merit board. Unfortunately, my gut was saying something oh, no. different. Yeah. That's what I, that's just why I was let, telling you. Just to let yeah. everyone know, no disrespect intended. My gut told me different. I'm sorry. And that's what I was <laughs> reiterating when I was on that board. You sit through and you hear things and you make mm -hmm. those decisions. And other times, there was one time, I'm going to tell it, I've said it before, uh, that on this dais as a councilman, I walked into the mayor at that time with my resignation letter as chairman because I didn't feel that the council respected us. But, you know, like you said, you got to look at every picture, every situation differently and judge it for yourself. And that, that I respect that more sometimes than I respect a yes or no vote. So that's important for me to you. And I understand yeah. from here on out, yeah. I know those don't happen often, but I plan to be there yeah. so I can and learn hear a little it. more. Yeah, yeah. That's and important. learn. Thank you. And there's no issues, Scott, with those public meetings, any of us being there, correct? That's right. So, All right, nothing else for the good of the order? We have one hour and 45 minutes. Time for lunch for you. So. We will be adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>